All right, thank you. Well, let's call to order uh, this meeting of the City of Bloomington Planning Commission for May 10th, 2021. Uh, let's begin with the roll call. Burrell. Here. Kate. Here. Herrera. Here. Kenzie. Here. Cockerum. Here. Sandberg. Here. Cyborg. I don't think he's there. Oh. He's in the waiting room. Andrew Cyborg. Here. St. John. Here. Whistler. Here. Thank you. All right, seeing that we have a quorum, uh, let's continue with the meeting. We um, do have minutes to be approved, minutes from the April 12th, 2021 meeting. Are there any uh, questions, corrections, or additions uh, to those minutes? Do we have a motion to approve those minutes? I'll motion to approve the April 12th minutes. Second. All right, so we have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor of approving those minutes, uh, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. Okay, so those minutes are approved. Uh, are there any reports, resolutions, or communications from staff before we get to our petitions tonight? No, we have, uh, we just wanted to let you know that the um, uh, ordinance and map updates are still uh, being heard by council. Um, we have uh, one correction uh, that is coming, uh, excuse me, one amendment that is coming back to you tonight. We'll briefly discuss uh, here in a moment. Um, and otherwise they are um, wrapping up, still working on the uh, Plex amendment and the map amendment, but um, all of the other ordinances that you sent to them, uh, they did not make amendments to. So um, thank you very much for your hard work on those. That's all we have. Excellent, thank you. Any reports uh, or communications uh, from commissioners this evening? All right, seeing none. So we, we have one petition uh, that has been continued uh, to our June meeting. That is SPDP 1421, uh, Aspen TOPCI 2 Acquisitions LLC. This is the property at 703 West Gorley Pike. Uh, this is a request for primary plat approval uh, for a 12.34 acre three lot traditional subdivision and major site plan approval for two student housing and dormitory and one dwelling multifamily in the RH high density district. That will be heard at our June meeting. There are two petitions uh, to be heard tonight. The first is ZO 03-21. This is the uh, technical corrections and amendments that uh, Jackie just mentioned um, to, the, to the UDO. Our second petition, is SP 1521 uh, Trinitas Ventures. This is site plan approval uh, for construction of multifamily residential development at 3216 East 3rd Street. So we'll begin uh, with CO 03 21. And uh, Jackie, are you going to yes, uh, present I'm this take one? That one. Mm -hmm. All right, take it away. Okay, so this should be pretty brief, uh, as I mentioned. Uh, ZO0321 um, is uh, amendments to chapter three um, of the uh, zoning ordinance. And the uh, council is suggesting two changes um, <clears throat> that they voted on, uh, each unanimous 9-0. The first is to um, include the sustainable development incentives as an option for um, decreased separation requirements for student housing or dormitory use and for increased options for four floor plate maximums for that use as well. Um, that is something that we amended uh, at this level um, related to the affordable housing incentives. So they are adding the sustainable development incentives to that. Um, and uh, the second is that um, they are requesting that the ground floor parking standards um, for student housing or dormitory be altered um, to match those that we wrote for multifamily. Uh, and we thought that both of those amendment requests were appropriate. 
Um, and uh, so they are sending those back to you for ratification. Um, so you will vote on uh, that tonight and uh, I can answer any questions. Thanks. Thank you, Jackie. Are there any questions for Jackie uh, from commissioners on what's before us? Okay. Um, last call for questions. All right, seems pretty straightforward. We will go to uh, public comment then um, on, um, let me get my number right, ZO03-21. Um, so any public comment on ZO03-21? If you'd like to make comment, just uh, click on the reactions tab or the participants tab book for the button that says raise hand. And that's how you can indicate that you'd like to make comment. I'm not seeing any, Jackie, uh, are you seeing any requests for I comment or anything any. on the Facebook feed? No, we are still having trouble. So no, there's nothing there. Thanks. Okay, all right. Well, then we are back to the commission uh, for any final comment or a, a motion. Um, I believe that uh, uh, the appropriate motion here would simply be to, um, to adopt uh, 03-21. As amended by council, I think would be fine. Uh, as amended by council, yeah. I'll move to adopt ZO-0321 uh, as amended by council. A second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any final comments before we call the roll? All right, let's call the roll. Kate. Yes. Carrera. Yes. Kenzie. Yes. Packram. Yes. Sandberg. Yes. Cyber. Yes. St. John. Yes. Whistler. Yes. And Burrell. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so I believe that passes. Nine zero. Is that correct? Yep. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Well, we will move on then uh, to our next and uh, final petition this evening, SP 15-21. Again, this is uh, a request for site plan approval to allow construction of a multifamily residential development uh, at 3216 East 3rd Street. And uh, Eric Grulick is the case manager. Uh, Eric, are you ready to present? Uh, Commissioner I hope so. Can you guys all see my screen? Anyone? Yes, uh, Commissioner Cochran, did you have a, a point of order there? Yeah, it, it, Jackie, I apologize. I, I probably should have brought this up earlier, but as I was reading through the document, um, and I don't know if we have a, uh, an attorney or one of our city attorneys on here as well, but I do represent Blooming Foods as one of their general real estate brokers. Um, so I am, I'm guiding them on this project. I just want to be in full disclosure, which is a part of this whole project. So I guess my question is, um, I guess, should I recruit myself from this conversation sure. because of um, We don't, unfortunately, I believe have a, a member of the legal department on tonight, but I do believe that because um, uh, because this particular discussion um, tonight, we're not taking a vote. Um, it, it's just a discussion. I think you can be part of the discussion. We'll clarify you before next week about whether or not the vote is uh, voting is appropriate. If that works for you. Okay, that sounds great. Because because Blooming Foods is a part of a part of this whole parcel. Right. I do not represent Trinitas, but I do yeah. represent. Blooming we'll Foods. verify that for you and let you know before next next. Fantastic. Month. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, Commissioner Cockrum, I think the the question. The uh, primary question to ask is whether you have a financial interest in this. Uh, my recommendation would be better safe than sorry. So um, uh, I think it'd be, I think you're welcome to stay on the conversation, but best if you kind of hang back and 
and, uh, and and leave it to the the rest of the commission for now, and and we'll try to get some some more guidance before the next meeting. Go ahead, Eric. If you're ready, take it away. Excellent. All right. Thanks, guys. Um, so as you mentioned, this is a request um, from Trinitas Ventures uh, for a property at 3216 East Third Street. Uh, this is at the southwest corner of uh, Third Street and Clariz and southeast kind of corner-ish uh, Kingston Boulevard, or I'm sorry, Kingston Drive. Uh, the site has been developed with a former Kmart store. It's about 100,000 square foot and Blooming Foods. Uh, the petitioner is proposing to remove the Kmart building and the parking areas to redevelop the site with a 340 unit student housing and multifamily development. Um, so they are here tonight requesting site plan approval for that petition. Um, so this is a current aerial showing the site. You can see the Kmart that's on the south side of the site. Uh, as I mentioned, it's about 100,000 square feet. Uh, there's a large surface parking area just to the north of that, uh, as well as the Blooming Food site that's at the northeast corner of this site. Uh, there is a bank that's at the northwest side of this property, but is on its own separate property, so that is not part of this petition. Um, so the petitioner is just proposing to redevelop the site with the Kmart and Blooming Foods. Um, so as I mentioned, they would be looking to redevelop this with a series of multifamily and student family developments. Uh, so this is the proposed site plan. Um, since the Blooming Foods is on this property, they are required to bring that into compliance with the UDO standards. Um, so they'll be doing some landscaping improvements, um, removing parking areas, um, installing some sidewalks and bike racks uh, as part of the overall development. Um, so you can see here the overall site plan. So I'll just kind of briefly go through some of the, the big points on this. Uh, the center portion of the building, they are, or the center portion of the site, they are proposing four buildings. Uh, these would all be student housing. Um, they're classified as student housing due to the bedroom diversity within those uh, buildings. And then on the south side of the site, they have two more multifamily apartment buildings um, and then a parking garage on the west side of the site. Um, so all total, uh, they are looking at 340 dwelling units and 906 bedrooms. Um, the parking garage would have approximately 500, or I'm sorry, 385 parking spaces, uh, counting the on-street spaces that they would be creating through uh, some of the interior drives and then the Blooming Foods, they will have a total of 542 parking spaces. So with this petition, they are proposing two drives that would go through the site um, on the north side and then the south side. These would be private drives, um, but they have been designed to public street standards. Um, so this would include installing new sidewalks and tree plots, uh, as well as the petitioner would be installing protected bike lanes along the Kingston Drive frontage, uh, the Clariz frontage, and then the, the Southern Drive, which is called Margaret Place, um, would have protected bike lanes as well. Uh, they would be also be installing uh, on-street parking spaces. Uh, the Northern Drive will have a sidewalk uh, on both sides and tree plot, and then uh, parallel parking spaces on the south side of that. Um, one of the aspects with this petition is they would be removing, uh, or I'm sorry, would be, are required to remove the parking uh, access that is on Third Street that Blooming Foods currently uses um, that you can see here on the north side of the site. Um, so they are removing that and installing a sidewalk through there. Um, since this kind of serves as the main pedestrian connection to the development from Third Street, you know, in addition to the side path, or I'm sorry, the multi-use path along Clariz, um, you know, one of the areas that we've highlighted for discussion is uh, making that sidewalk uh, a little bit wider so that it accomplishes, or I'm sorry, accommodates uh, a little bit more multimodal uh, transportation, uh, as well as uh, landscaping along both sides of that to improve the look and feel of that path. Um, as I mentioned, since that's kind of the main entryway into the site from Third Street. Um, so one of the other nice features about this petition is that sidewalk lines up with a park uh, that is shown running through the center of the site uh, called Frida Park. Uh, and then this wraps around and becomes a, a larger park on the south side of the site um, called Latimer Park that has a playground uh, and other amenities in that area. So they have a substantial amount of green space on the site. Um, 
The zoning on this site requires a minimum landscape area of 40%, um, which this petition meets um, through the incorporation of these two parks, uh, green space along the streets, as long as green space within the courtyards and around the property as a whole. Um, so it does meet the uh, minimum landscape area requirement of 40%. Um, so with this, uh, of course, bicycle parking is required as well. Um, based on the number of bedrooms, uh, the 906 bedrooms, they're required one bicycle space for every five, um, which equals 182 bicycle parking spaces that are required for the site as a whole. Um, so as is typical with a lot of the developments that we have seen lately, uh, the petitioners will be setting aside portions of the interior of the buildings for the long-term bicycle parking that they're required. Uh, as well as having exterior parking, bicycle parking adjacent to all of the buildings. Um, those are required to be covered. Um, so that uh, has been shown on the site plan. Um, in general, the, as I mentioned, they're required 182 bicycle parking and they are providing 186. Um, so they're slightly over, uh, which is a good thing. Um, so they certainly meet their, their minimum bicycle uh, parking requirements. Um, you know, I'll also briefly kind of just take this opportunity to mention uh, that Clarias Boulevard is accessed by Bloomington Transit. Um, so that this does have good uh, transit access from, uh, from the bus line. Um, so now I'll just kind of step through some of the, the architecture for these buildings. Um, so as I mentioned, there are two different housing components with this project. There is the student housing buildings that are in the center of the site. Um, and then the multifamily buildings that are on the south end of the site. Uh, both of these series of buildings kind of have their own unique look and design. Um, so I'll just kind of go through each one individually. So these are some of the renderings for the student housing buildings. Um, so these will feature a flat roof uh, design. Um, all of the buildings are required to have three of four architectural features that govern the exterior facade of the building. Um, so with this, the three aspects that they are proposing to meet uh, are the change in building height with a minimum of five feet, um, which you can see running along the top of these modules of not more than 40 feet apart, uh, and then the change of building height. Uh, the second element uh, is a regular pattern of glass comprising not less than 50% of the ground floor, um, which are showing along this ground floor, um, and then a series of awnings and canopies. Um, so they've shown those along uh, each of the entrances of these buildings. Um, so that is how they are meeting the exterior facade um, requirements. Um, so one of the things that we've highlighted in the staff report uh, is the end facade of some of these buildings. Um, so with that, they are proposing to meet those uh, exterior facade requirements through the difference in building height as well as the module that sticks out. Um, However, we're, we're a little bit concerned about some of the open space along the bottom. Uh, we'd like to try to see a little bit more windows if possible along the ground floor, or maybe on the upper floor, uh, just to help break up the view of that um, since you're seeing that from the street. Um, so that is one of the areas that we've highlighted for some input from the plan commission uh, on these end caps of the buildings. Um, so this is kind of the uh, other buildings. This is the leasing office. Um, uh, again, they are proposing to meet the exterior facade requirements through the awnings and canopies, uh, the modulation, and then the change in building height. Um, so we don't have any issues necessarily with, with that particular building. Um, one aspect I, I wanted to mention as we're talking about the leasing office uh, is that the petitioner would be proposing a plaza and bus stop just adjacent to that leasing office. Um, so this is over on the corner of Kingston and Margaret Place. Um, so they would have a new covered bus stop for Bloomington Transit uh, and then a large plaza area next to that. Uh, certainly a lot of the tenants living here will be utilizing the Bloomington Transit bus line uh, that comes in off of Kingston uh, as well as off of Clare is. Um, so they're providing that, that bus shelter there for the residents. Uh, the residential buildings um, would have a pitched, pitched roof design. So this is different. Uh, than the flat roof design for the student housing buildings. Uh, again, kind of the same thing that they are meeting the exterior facade requirements through the change in building height, through the dormers that stick up through the, uh, the center consoles there, uh, regular pattern of glass along the bottom, uh, not more than 50 or not less than 50%, uh, and then awnings and canopies along those uh, entrances as well. 
Um, so again, kind of the, the end facade on some of these units, um, which you can see we're, we're kind of concerned with the look of those. Um, so we'd like to try to see some improvements made to those end caps uh, just to get a little bit more glass and windows in there so we're not looking at so much of a, a blank wall. Um, so finally, moving along to the parking garage, um, this is uh, another aspect that we're kind of looking for any input from the Planning Commission on, uh, especially in regards to the architecture. Um, you know, as I mentioned, the, uh, the three of the four exterior facade requirements uh, require either a change in building height, uh, modulation recesses, awnings or canopies, uh, and or regular pattern of glass. Um, so the modulation is not really something that is very easy to accomplish with the parking garage. Um, so the petitioner is looking to meet the architectural standards through the change in building height, uh, the regular pattern of glass, and the awnings. Um, some of the sides of the garage have the, the glass in there that comprise the 50%. Um, however, some of those, uh, illustration number two here, uh, along the, the west, the south side, uh, is kind of lacking some of that glass, although this is not highly visible. Uh, the code does require kind of uniform architecture around the buildings. Uh, and then moving along to the, uh, the middle slide here, this would be the east side of the building facing the courtyard. Again, this would not be seen from the public view. Um, however, they are required to meet those architectural requirements. We've got some blank face along there. Um, the Schmidt memo did recommend uh, some minor modifications that could be made to the garage to help make it look a little bit better, um, widening the columns, uh, incorporating a little bit more glass. Um, that has been included in your, your packet as well for your review. Um, so these are just, again, kind of some of the renderings. Uh, the buildings uh, have the glass along the bottom. Uh, the bottom slide here, this would be the side facing Clare is. So this is the main side facing the public street. Uh, there certainly needs to be a little bit more glass on the north side of that in order to meet the um, modulation, or I'm sorry, the, the open glass that I mentioned, uh, the minimum 50%. Um, so petitioners have submitted a landscape plan um, using species that are identified in UDO. Uh, these are all native species. Uh, they would be installing street trees throughout the property as well. Um, so just kind of stepping through, as I mentioned, they would have to do improvements to the blooming food site. So this would require installing islands in the parking areas, uh, shrubs and trees along the parking area to meet those requirements, uh, as well as landscaping throughout the sites as well. Um, one of the other areas that we've highlighted for comment and concern um, regard some mechanicals and dumpster enclosures. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of step through those to, to show you what we're looking at. Um, so there are some, some transformer boxes that are kind of scattered around the exterior of the building. Uh, the UDO requires that mechanicals uh, be screened from public view and as, as best as possible. Um, so we'd like to try to see these transformer boxes uh, moved further back into the site or screened in some way. Uh, preferably, we would like to have these moved further back so they're not right along the sidewalks uh, where people are going to be walking and, and most visible. Uh, as well as there's a dumpster enclosure on the north side of that building um, that would be visible from Kingston. Um, this is an area, you know, I'll just kind of point this out. This is an area of the site plan uh, that the petitioners have left open uh, for a possible future building. Um, so that's in this area here. Um, so they've left that open as grass space for a possible building in the future. Uh, however, that may or may not happen. Um, you know, we could be looking at a big open green space for a considerable length of time. Um, so we want to make sure that that dumpster enclosure that's shown uh, on that north side of the site, uh, ideally would get moved somewhere else so that it's not visible from Kingston, um, but at the very least uh, screened appropriately. Uh, again, some utility boxes and transformer boxes that are located uh, between the buildings and the street, we would like to see relocated to somewhere else on the site um, so that they're not so visible from the public street, um, at the very least screen so that uh, they're, they're not so visible. Um, so I'll just kind of step through some overall rendering so you can get a feel for the, the site as a whole. Um, so these are some renderings showing some of the parks. Um, so the top is the view from Latimer Park. Uh, kind of looking south uh, through the site. 
or I'm sorry, looking north through the site. Um, so you can see the multifamily building on the right side, uh, and then kind of the center of the screen, you can see the uh, student housing building, uh, and then Third Street would be further left in the foreground. Uh, view on the right uh, is looking from Margaret Place. Uh, again, this would be looking at the multifamily buildings. Um, you can see the protected bike lane that's illustrated here in this rendering. Uh, the bottom is the multifamily area. So this would be looking at the large park that's in front of the, the multifamily buildings. Uh, and then the bottom is the view of Frida Park looking north uh, towards Third Street, uh, or I'm sorry, looking south uh, towards the multifamily. So this would be looking from Third Street through the site. Um, these are some renderings showing some of the buildings. Uh, again, the student housing buildings on the north, on the top left of your screen, um, and then the multifamily on the top right, um, student housing on the bottom left, and then the leasing office that we described, uh, and then the plaza and bus station um, on the bottom right of your screen here. Uh, again, just some other renderings showing the park, uh, and then the parking garage, uh, and then the bottom is just an overall aerial view of the site. Um, you've got the, the multifamily buildings uh, that are on the, the right side with the mall just beyond that. Uh, and then the student housing buildings kind of in the center of that site there. Um, so as I kind of mentioned, going through the presentation, uh, there are a couple of areas that we are looking for uh, any input on and, and some further revisions. Uh, the end caps of the buildings, uh, as I mentioned, especially the sides that are facing the public streets are an area that we'd like to see some improvement on. Uh, the parking garage as well, uh, we believe needs uh, some additional improvements in order to meet code requirements. Uh, the highlighted utility boxes and dumpsters, uh, we'd like to see moved uh, to be not so visible. Um, the sidewalk connection from Third Street running through Bloomy Foods connecting the site, we'd like to see some improvements on that. Um, and then any comments on the proposed vehicular connections through the site. Uh, as well would be welcome any comments. Um, so with that, we are, we are recommending to forward this to the June 4th hearing um, and would welcome any comments from the Planning Commission on any of the aspects that I've kind of highlighted here. Great, thank you, Eric. Is there uh, a representative of the petitioner who would like to add anything uh, to the presentation? Eric, who will be speaking for them? You know? Looks like Ryan is... Uh, Raising his hand there. Uh, yeah, Ryan Call um, would be Juan Josh Anderson. Um, I think Ryan might be the lead on this. Okay, great. Thanks. There you go. Uh, Eric, is it okay if I share my screen? Um, we, you did a great job. I don't, I can go through mine pretty quick, but I did put together a little presentation, um, if that's all right. Yep, you should be able to. Great, thank you. All right. Well, yeah, Eric did a really good job. So I apologize for a little bit of redundancy that will happen here, but uh, hopefully you'll you'll get a little more insight into our thinking and our process. Um, uh, but generally, thank you very much for your time tonight and, and allowing us to uh, present. Our team, uh, Trinitas, uh, is the developer. Uh, ELS Architecture and Urban Design is, is who I work for. We're in Berkeley, California. Uh, we've been around 50 or so years. Uh, we're a boutique design and planning firm. Uh, CSO out in Indianapolis is our architect for the project, and they have uh, done quite a bit of work here in Bloomington. Uh, Anderson Bolander, we have uh, a great land set, uh, landscape architecture team who's also done work here at the Trades District. THP's our parking consultant. And then, of course, uh, Bynum Fanio uh, for the engineering side of our project. Uh, one of the great things uh, that happened between 2018 and 2021 was really the, the UDO taking on a, a new form in the Midtown Corridor zoning. So, uh, but in general, speaking generally, just the, the level of macro thinking and micro thinking that's been built into the comprehensive plan, the transportation plan, and the UDO provided us a very, very clear path to implementation and uh, we greatly appreciate that. It allowed us to really hit the ground running with uh, Eric and Neil. Uh, the precedent, of course, for many of the ideas that are embedded in those documents, uh, you experience firsthand every day. It's not abstract, it's not a new idea. It's your city uh, that you have that's quite lovely and beautiful. Uh, 
in 2018, when I uh, arrived here for the first time, I thought, wow, this is, you know, this is America's postcard. You have this vibrant downtown with a mix of new and old buildings. It's extremely walkable, a very tight knit grid of streets. And kind of the most interesting and, and beautiful thing that's been preserved in your city over time is the fact that you could work in a variety of different occupations and there's a neighborhood that's walkable to that occupation nearby facilitated by this incredible grid. So that was a, a wonderful, wonderful president to work from and goals to work towards in the implementation of our project. Uh, so the opportunity of course, and Kmart is presenting this opportunity all over the country, uh, is that we're overbuilt in retail. And so the, the days of getting everything you need uh, at Kmart have been replaced by uh, Amazon delivery trucks and you know basically shopping from your phone. And so the need for these large format retailers with uh, expansive parking lots is diminishing. And all over the country, they're being replaced by higher and better uses. And so the, the opportunity here is to leverage the infrastructure in place, introduce uh, a, a product that the city needs, and that helps also take the pressure off uh, an outward expansion of the city. So keeping uh, build up and in versus low and out. I, the grid, as I mentioned before, uh, and it's not, it's not something that we ever take for granted. So many cities across the country have cul-de-sacs and giant super blocks, and they just, there's no way to undo the damage that's been done. But in Bloomington, your footprint of your city is so compact and, and the grid is so intact that there are really only a few parts of the city where the development standards in the 60s, 50s, 60s, and 70s created something that wasn't walkable. And so now with the changes in retail, we have a chance to implement that walkable grid and start threading through those uh, networks through these parcels. And uh, so the, the Kmart site really represents that opportunity. And of course, this has already been thought of in your transportation plan. So the Hunter uh, Avenue extension, which has been planned all the way from one side of the mall to the other, we get to build the first leg of that. So. Uh, the Midtown Corridor zoning was a, a, a fantastic development in the process for us because not only were we able to uh, understand more clearly what the, the city uh, needed, there's some uh, design guidance that's built into it that's you know really progressive. And you know the idea that your maximum block length is 550 feet or that you have the 60-40 uh, impervious pervious relationship, all of these things start to really craft uh, a very environmentally sensitive and humane scale of architecture and urban design. Uh, one of the things that we took with that opportunity is if you have to have 40% of your site being landscaped, let's make it, uh, let's try and consolidate it in a way that delivers something really meaningful and valuable to the public. So uh, we got quite excited to shape what became Latimer Park and then Frida Park in that process to kind of really take that idea and turn it into a placemaking element. So our project goals, part of this is we're in a retail district. It's, it's almost solely retail in its current form. There's a lot of benefits that come along with that. Uh, we also see a, a synergistic relationship where our housing can play a role in helping sustaining the retail that is remain, uh, relevant. Uh, still relevant and supporting that. So I'll talk about designing ultimate convenience, which is a uh, you know, residential plus uh, or mixed use approach, horizontal mixed use approach to a lot of shopping center redevelopment. Uh, repair and preserve. Uh, you know, the landscape that was created when the Kmart was built uh, is uh, less than 10% landscape. So it's, it's very, uh, that's kind of brutal. It's just a vast expanse of asphalt. The building is generic uh, and stamped out all over the country. So those are things that we're you know, going to dramatically transform. Uh, and then the memorable spaces to gather. Uh, this is a benefit that translates directly to uh, the success of the project. But it's one of those neat benefits that also translates to the success of the district. And so we can take that idea of this public open space and it, yeah, it actually helps rent our units. There's great activities that can happen um, at the, the complex itself, but it's also this place where in the College Mall District, there isn't a, a park outside of Latimer Woods. There's a place now where it can become uh, something bigger than itself and pull in the public and help create these kind of vibrant and active streets that we think will help 
make the place more meaningful. So uh, the, the site has two uh, on-site bus lines, three and eight, and then nearby we have the university bus line down at uh, uh, Buick and Cadillac Boulevard. So that convenience is really great to build off. It allows us to have fewer cars in the project, so less parking spaces. Uh, allows us to be more urban with our buildings because we're building less surface parking or structured. So it allows us to focus on the pedestrian, on the bike, on the walkability, uh, and take the focus off the car, which often defines so much housing and ends up pushing everything apart. So uh, that, that's really a fantastic element. The other part is with cell phones, uh, retail has really changed. In some ways, it's really struggling. But retail is still a really important part of a city. So the ultimate convenience is, well, if you can walk to Target in five minutes, it's better than ordering from Target. And then the other ultimate convenience, of course, is having two grocery stores right on site. And we see this as being extremely attractive to the residents that will live here and uh, a great amenity. So we're hoping we, we, there's a benefit to us, but there's also hopefully a benefit to those uh, grocery stores with the residents having uh, that incentive to just walk next door versus getting in the car and driving somewhere else. Uh, my other first impression of uh, Bloomington was your countryside is still nearby. You could actually be in the center of town and drive five to 10 minutes out of town. And it's just some of the most beautiful scenery. Um, you know, in contrast to my life here in California, where nature is a 40 minute, you know, uh, a rush hour commute. It's, it's, uh, there's a big det detachment and it's almost an abstract concept. Whereas uh, the people who live and work in the agrarian industry, and the life that comes with that are still very much part of your immediate community. And also the, the scenic beauty of that and that resource and the benefit that gives to the community, it's really important. So it's a long way of saying our thought is let's take these sites that need redevelopment like the Kmart and then build up so that your housing demand is satisfied internal to your existing footprint of your city. And uh, you can preserve this beautiful legacy for generations to come. Uh, and again, this is the memorable spaces to gather. We really look to public open space, not in a way that just uh, has one or two things to do, but it, it appeals to kids. It appeals to seniors. It appeals to uh, a couple of folks or someone by themselves, where we program it in a way that it appeals to a birthday party or 10 people or larger groups. And the design of public open spaces has evolved a lot over the years into something that is really designed to be more relevant to a broader spectrum of users and uh, you know, having a variety of different experiences. So as you'll notice in Latimer Park, uh, we have uh, nature playscapes, um, which is this concept where it's not a plastic play structure, but it's actually looking at you know, mounding or um, planks or different things that are natural materials. They're attractive to adults, but they're also really fun for kids. Uh, and then we have just large uh, flexible open space greens and then we have uh, outdoor uh, barbecue effort, uh, uh, sorry, outdoor barbecue spaces that allow, that give people a reason to use and gather in these parks. And then of course, being sensitive to sun and, and shade and those things to make them more comfortable and user-friendly. Uh, so in the next few slides, I'm gonna walk through the site plan and architecture. Uh, Eric did a really great job of covering this, so I think I can be fairly, fairly brief. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, anytime you can achieve a block that's less than 300 feet, it puts you in a very rare collection of cities that are that walkable. And that's something that uh, is really quite pleasant with your, your existing grid. Uh, in many places, it is that small. And so that's something that actually lends itself really well to the, the dimensions and the size of our site. And uh, coupled with that, in the UDO, there's the requirement for the 20,000 maximum uh, footprint for the student dormitory uh, buildings. And so that, if you look at that requirement and you look at the requirement for the 40% landscaping, um, and you look at the precedent of your city's walkable grid, there's just a very, very natural recipe for a very walkable site plan. Uh, so our block sizes uh, at largest are the 270 by 273. Um, and then we're very, uh, we're actually really quite uh, excited about the, the number of um, 
the, the amount of permeability through the site. So getting across to east-west has been greatly enhanced. Uh, currently, there's a giant grade difference between Kingston Drive and where the top of the Kmart is. There's about 15 feet. We're going to gently grade that up. So it's, you know, it's, it's not hard to walk. It's not slippery in the winter, but it's a, a gentle slope that gets you from Clariz all the way down to Target. So this is making people's trips a little easier to get um, to the places they want to go. Uh, we also, and this was uh, uh, figuring out the grades on the site was actually one of the biggest challenges because there's a very substantial dip. The site slopes down um, up here uh, by fifth thirds and then slopes up quite rapidly. Um, so we brought the site up five or six feet and brought the site down here just a little bit, two or three feet. And then we're able to eliminate ramps and uh, eliminate switchbacks, eliminate stairs. And we created a very, very natural, almost flat. It's not flat, it's got a gentle slope, but a, a, a very gentle grade of four feet change across the two, 270, um, which we're really excited about. So uh, the, the parks, we have the 1.1 acre park at Latimer Park, and we have, uh, this is a half acre park here. So, the other thing that the um, our design team is excited about is the level of connectivity that has been implemented in this project. And uh, a lot of that thinking, again, was already in place with the transportation plan, which is a really great document. And one of the things that uh, we were able to grab onto quite quickly with our discussions with Eric and Neil was uh, how the, the streets typologies, the general urban and the neighborhood connector, could be applied to our, our site for the code. And then we worked with them and we're still working with them to continue to refine the details of executing that. But essentially what we've created is uh, uh, a place where you can bike in tremendous safety uh, from uh, vehicular traffic. And as a pedestrian, you're very safe. And so we see you know, these small steps towards the big step of the overall area redeveloping over time uh, is a kind of crucial link to connecting to those really fine grained uh, street grid downtown and extending the bike and pedestrian ac access throughout the city. We have uh, 5,200 feet, lineal feet of sidewalks on a, on a 12 acre site. And we have a uh, half a mile of bike lanes on our site. So not that there are bike lanes to receive all of our bike lanes, but in the future, the infrastructure is there for those to be part of a larger network. Uh, it was really interesting to look at the calculations between where the site started and where the site has uh, ended in our current proposed site plan. So, uh, you know, starting at Third Street, currently the Blooming Foods parking lot comes right up to uh, the multi-use path. And then you have the multi-use path and the small planning strip, and then, of course, Third Street. Uh, the UDO requires that the setback for parking lot is 20 feet behind the setback of the building itself and the building is 20 feet setback so and so parking lot we now have 40 feet of landscaping along the third street frontage which is an incredible enhancement of the visual aesthetic uh, character of the site as you drive by so in short it really improves the curb appeal of, of the whole project um, Blooming Foods, of course, is an important asset to the resident residents here. Uh, the, the folks, we're hoping that there's a very good synergistic relationship between the success of Blooming Foods and the, the amenity it provides the residents. Um, and then uh, the other uh, requirement in the UDO that is a tremendous benefit is the uh, the amount of trees and shrubs that are required. So all of our, all of our streets are lined with trees. Uh, there's uh, a lot of rich landscaping. There will be color variety, a lot of native species that will uh, uh, be natural here. Um, so all of those things in the 4.8 acres of, of landscaping space really brings a lot of, I think, aesthetic quality and, and uh, to the project. This is more for reference. We've basically just kind of cataloged uh, the, the statistics of uh, where our plan landed. So we can come back to this. Uh, and then these are some of the views that Eric showed. So we'll look at them again very shortly. Uh, this is Latimer Park. Uh, the kind of kids' natural play areas are in these corners. The dining is here. 
Uh, we also have areas that are they're in little enclosures that are perfect for couples or a group of four. And then, of course, a lot large lawn area where you could have frisbee or various things to, to encourage recreation. Uh, you can see this view uh, from Margaret Place. So if you're on that uh, kind of main street in our project looking at uh, the park, uh, it's about the same uh, acreage as Seminary Park uh, for reference in, in your mind. Uh, but what's nice about this is we've got housing on four sides of it. So the idea of having safe public open spaces with eyes on them uh, during, you know, most times at night during the day helps people feel more comfortable in the space and a greater sense of security and, and hopefully more activity. Uh, hey, Ryan, this is Eric. I just want to let you know you have four minutes left. All right, that's good. I've got about six slides. <laughs> I'll keep it going. Uh, this is just a, a view looking onto the lawn itself. Uh, and then this is the park. So, uh, you know, these are these wood planks that you can kind of take through the trees. And then we have um, uh, this uh, lighting over top the dining area. So it should be quite nice. And we can jump back to these exhibits as need be. Uh, Free to Park, this is the big connector between the Third Street District and Latimer Park. Um, and then uh, just the general urban typology, we've worked on that with Neil and Eric. We're still refining it, but it's essentially you have two through lanes of traffic, the parallel parking, a wide tree plot, uh, the bike lane itself, and then the sidewalk. Uh, these are the views of the housing. And uh, the other in, um, interesting point was developing a, a, a number of entries on Clariz. So several of the units will have access right to Clariz and that will help activate the street as well as the building entries. Um, and then this is our amenity building. And then the parking structure. And then this is how it is today. And it's not the most polished rendering, but this is where it's, where it's going on our site plan. So you can see that there's quite a bit more landscape and you can kind of get a sense for the, the scale of the public open space that people will be able to enjoy. And then also the connectivity to Target. So that's that's um, that's enough of me talking. Uh, we can <laughs> uh, move to to the next uh, to questions or um, uh, next step. Great, thank you, Ryan. Are there any questions from commissioners, either for staff uh, or for the petitioner? Ryan, if you don't mind uh, ending your screen share, sure, that'll kind of help. Uh, let's get a better view of the audience here. Great, thank you. Um, Commissioner Kinsey, I think I saw your hand first. Go ahead. Sure, I'll lead off. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, thanks for the uh, description and thank you, Eric, for the very um, full and comprehensive description of this project. Uh, first, I wanna say, Ryan, I'm really happy to hear um, the references to explicit criteria that are now part of our comprehensive plan and the UDO. And, and I'm really glad to hear that that was of use to you. And um, so that, probably should have been reserved for a comment, but, but I'm happy to hear it. That my questions um, are several and they, I'm gonna begin with some of my concerns about green building practices that the Environmental Commission raised in their um, comments about this space. And I wonder if you can comment, particularly given the amendment we just approved that the city council enacted around sustainable practices, that if you can comment on why or what the possibilities are for green building practices for this. I, I, I can't fathom doing a project of this scope and magnitude without very specific references to green building practices. So I'm a little surprised that they're not mentioned in here. So I wonder if you can explain a little bit more of that. Yeah, I'll do, uh, you know, my, my expertise and in particular focus on this project is with the site plan. So I'll speak to that just really quickly. Um, where this is, you know, we're not pursuing a lead accreditation on this, but uh, we do look at those criteria um, for reference. And from the site plan criteria, uh, there are a number of you know boxes that we could check and that we're very proud to check because of the you know the natural built-in infrastructure that exists at the site already. Um, so the from the transit access to um, you know the the in infill aspect of it. All of those things are, are very helpful in the reduction of trips and the environmental benefit that comes from the building. 
Um, for the buildings themselves, I think I'll hand that to uh, Mark and, and Dan Brugger with CSO. Uh, Mark Becker with uh, Trinitas. Can... Yep, just a sec. Thanks. Uh -huh. Hi, can you all hear me? Yep. Great. Hi, I'm Mark Becker with uh, Trinitas Ventures, um, and thanks, Ryan, for the introduction. Um, Dan Brugger with CSO is our building architect, and he can probably speak closer to um, some of the green practices. A lot of our efforts so far have been focused on the site plan and the um, general planning aspect of the um, of the development, given the nature of the submission and um, and how this is uh, looked at as far as most uh, a lot based on site planning. So we are very excited about all the green aspects that we're bringing to the site development and to the site planning and bringing um, what is basically a gray field site into a site that has 40% um, pervious uh, area and then also a number of parks and a lot of very sustainable um, measures. So, um, so on the on the site plan, we're like I said, we're very excited about that. On the building side, um, I can turn it over to um, Dan Brugger um, just on some of the overall um, aspects, and a lot of these are aspects that we're continuing to investigate. So, um, so we're still working through those those items right now. Yeah, I can speak specifically to a number of architectural practices. And as Ryan said, we might not be um, specifically trying to achieve a LEED certification, but there are a lot of building practices that we're going to employ that we're already counting on employing that already are sustainable practices and are good best practices for green building. Um, in particular, for example, on some of the buildings, the three buildings, the student housing buildings that have a, a flat roof, um, that's a lighter roof material, um, which definitely helps with um, urban heat island effect to have that light color on the roof material. Um, a lot of the buildings we've gone to a really great extent to provide as much daylighting as we can into the building um, through increased glazing and that helps um, on two accounts. One, access to daylighting for the occupant, which is an indoor um, environmental quality, but also two, the ability to get fresh air and indoor air quality improvements through operable windows and providing really more windows than were necessary, but but it, we believe it helps the um, the quality of life and the occupants. Um, the the overhangs and canopies and and grade level entrances that were pointed out as being um, included in the building also help to shade a lot of the building entrances at the grade level. Um, and the the tight configuration of the buildings themselves on the plan, the way those uh, four-story buildings are positioned, helps create a lot of summer shading in those corridors uh, throughout different times of day for the building. So it's kind of a case of the planning helping, helping the architecture. Um, I would also mention that we're recycling a good deal of material on the site, and Ryan might refresh my memory on exactly what material that is on the site. I believe it was the asphalt. The, yeah, the asphalt would be completely recycled. Uh, on site and, and and Jeff can go into that more detail, but that's that that goes back to the one of the biggest time stinks for this whole project was uh, the engineering part of it and uh, getting those grades correct. And so if you uh, uh, look at the grades for especially the buildings that are where the the slope transitions the most, which is really uh, north of Margaret Place. Uh, we've set them, they're, they're set apart five foot increments. They, the slope transitions four feet across the buildings and they've been set in a way that basically we don't have to haul off the, the ground up asphalt, you know, that we actually take that material and use it to set the buildings in the right elevation. So. I, I think perhaps the last item I would mention as a as a uh, sustainable green building practice is the materials we're looking at on the buildings, um, the combination of brick and block, which are durable long term materials which should not need replacement. Um, in short order, the use of things like fiber cement, which has a naturally high amount of recycled content already in it, and is also a, a durable and long lasting material. Those kinds of things that um, we're looking at, kind of a um, timelessness and durability of the building products themselves contributing toward that sustainability. Let me just ask explicitly then, all of those things sound great. 
Um, no solar panels planned at this point. I mean, it wouldn't be necessarily specified at this point, but as far as you know, no solar panels, no vegetative roofs. Is that part of any of the plans? Yeah, currently there are no solar panels or vegetative roofs planned. Okay. Okay, and then it sounds like there's a lot put into the landscape um, that I appreciate any attempt to look at no mow options or meadows. Uh, I, I saw a lot of green grass in those images. I know they're just renderings at this point, but um, I wondered about some of uh, the no mow options for our chemically hungry lawns. Josh, do you want to tackle that a little bit? Josh Anderson with Anderson Bullender should be on. He might be muted. Should be able to. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Josh. Uh, yeah, I appreciate the question. So, um, I don't know if the, can the site plan be up while I'm speaking. It might it might help. There is a lot of green on there in the rendering. Um, the areas where it, I think you can probably tell though, right? What's what's lawn versus what's green, but non tree. Um, and what what we've tried to do is. Uh, use a combination of native plantings and pollinators in the area where we don't anticipate a lot of activity. Um, there are areas though where we do anticipate a, a lot of foot traffic where we do have, you know, more of the typical lawn. Um, uh, I, I don't know that I, we have not used uh, NOMO type of options in the past on things where we anticipate it being um, more of a playable service for activity. Uh, we, we can look further into that, um, but I'd have to familiarize myself with the, sort of the durability and, and so forth of that more. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I think those are um, interesting kind of new developments in terms of what space is available um, and what can be done in landscaping. The other question I have is um, about some of the congestion that I've noticed already, traffic congestion in the area, particularly coming off the road uh, from west to east, uh, uh, that's essentially behind the Chick-fil-A and could be the kind, kind of considered the northernmost entrance to the Target parking lot. That gets significantly backed up now, and I wonder uh, of people turning on to Kingston and I wonder if there's been any discussion about how to relieve some of that congestion. I appreciate the um, addressing on Third Street because it's certainly turning in where you're currently able to turn into Blooming Foods would be just awful congestion on Third Street. But what about that Kingston congestion that's been occurring quite a bit? One of the aspects of our site plan, and is it okay if I share my screen again, Brad? The just uh, think it might be easier to talk over. Well, sure, go one. ahead. Thanks. Um, all right, so let me back up a little bit to a site plan. One of the things that we've done uh, in, quite intentionally was we tucked the parking district, uh, you know, basically just right off the mall ring road. Uh, and then we also have access off Clariz uh, and this was actually a suggestion that came through our design review process uh, with the city that the parking access for the parking deck could be uh, directly off our internal uh, private street, Margaret Place. So essentially, if you're if you're living on this site, your traffic contribution to the site, uh, you know, if if Kingston is congested, then you can drive out to Clariz and take Clariz to get down to Buick Boulevard or up to Third Street. Uh, you could also hit the mall ring road and exit um, that side as well. I suspect most people will probably use Margaret Place to get in and out of the garage. Um, the, you know, the, the extent to that we can control and, and influence traffic patterns on our site, we've definitely done, you know, as much as we can. Uh, as far as targets, uh, ability and, and the generation generated or the traffic generated by Chick-fil-A and Target, those things are something that we wanted to make sure that our residents had an alternative to those traffic mm -hmm. patterns in order to avoid that congestion, but we can't really influence too much those particular yeah. pieces. I don't know if staff um, have any comments about that, if there's any other considerations for that traffic onto Kingston. 
Um, yeah, you know, there, there's just not a lot that they can really do. There are signalized, both of those are signalized intersections, Kingston and Clariz. Um, you know, Kingston is a public drive, um, but, you know, after that point, a lot of this is just internal access and management issues due to it being a very popular place. Um, yeah, that's, that's unfortunately just a reality of a lot of folks coming and going to one place. Um, you know, certainly the roads through here and spreading that up and creating multiple access points helps disperse that so you don't funnel traffic congestion as much to and from one access point. Um, but some of that, unfortunately, is just the nature of, of a lot of activity, you know, maybe with future redevelopment to the mall, there might be other access points that we can look at to help increase that. Um, but, you know, we also have to carefully manage, you know, those number of access points from public roads uh, so that we can minimize traffic accidents and, and uh, conflict points. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Well, one last question, then I'll leave it to some other folks. Um, I appreciate the consideration of, and inclusion of blooming foods in this space, and I do think it's a community asset that uh, is wonderful to see included in this project. I wonder if you could describe a little bit more about uh, the space that um, will be improved around blooming foods. I saw just some, you know, large, uh, what I'm guessing are improved sidewalks or space around it. I couldn't get, quite get a feel for what will be improved? I understand the improvements to Third Street. The, um, that makes a lot of sense. But what about right near in front of the building and the trees? I, I see some islands in there um, in the parking area. Are there other anything more significant planned, particularly to the uh, south of the building? It looks, I'll, I'll just say it's, it's the most unattractive aspect of our lovely Blooming Foods is that south side part of the building currently. Yeah, you know, it's not obvious at a first glance, but their parking lot is, uh, in its current form today, it's kind of strange how it, there's, the borders between it and the Kmart are real ambiguous. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we actually, by implementing uh, this kind of east-west uh, street um, and, and defining the edges of their parking, which is also required by the UDO, uh, we restriped their entire lot. And we actually found a way to give them the, the spots they have in a smaller footprint, which then provided us a tremendous um, benefit from the 60-40 the requirement. On the Caloris side, uh, and Josh, you can elaborate a little bit more, but essentially there's, I think, a very clever solution where Caloris, uh, we are you know, creating a protected bike lane on Caloris. We have a tree plot. And then we have the sidewalk. So there'll be a slight scaling down of Clariz to uh, one lane southbound. And then uh, the sidewalk, the unfortunate thing, Blooming Foods is you know, in place. We can't change its location. Uh, but there's very little setback between Blooming Foods east facade and the curb line. So that area has been reserved for uh, a sidewalk and a planning uh, uh, planning strip, and then the bike lane has moved out. On the south side, which is the service axis, as you're describing, we created that island of trees there. Uh, uh, that you can, it's kind of like an upside down U uh, shape that will allow the circulation for their trucks and their service vehicles and the trash pickup. But we want to screen it too. We don't want the residents who are in those buildings to look right onto that, that element. So we created as much tree as we could in front of it. So you'll notice there are two trees that are planted along that. Josh, do you want to um, elaborate on some of the planting uh, concepts that you've provided for Blooming Foods? You might be muted. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think I think you described it well. But the the trees are probably the major addition. But if you if you can zoom in on that just slightly, and I, it may be pixelated, but um, yeah, that that helps. If you see the, um, for instance, twenty three PVP, eighteen A and A, seventy PDT, all of those are um, have height to them. Those plantings underneath the tree as well. So the hope is for uh, that it'll screen that um, utilitarian area pretty well. Uh, we, we got the drive aisles kind of as narrow as we could and in a way that would still let them get access and deliver what they need to to the site. Um, 
And then on the left-hand side, you can see the darker, those are, um, you know, more of an evergreen tree. So uh, considering the constraints, um, we feel pretty good about the, the landscape buffer that's, that's gonna happen there. Thank you. Sure. And then the, it looks like the front just had some additional pavers or is that a patio space? I don't know if that's, it seems like there's a different, um, it, at least it's a different color. I don't know if that signifies anything um, in the renderings in the like near the front of the building. Yeah, we've, we don't have uh, specifically an outdoor patio, although I've noticed that they've very successfully repurposed part of their parking lot for that. Uh, but we do have uh, the bike parking that's right by the entry and the AD, reconfigured ADA parking um, that's, that's there in the rendered plan. Okay, thank you. Thanks, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Sandberg, you're up next. Thank you. Yeah, this is Susan Sandberg. I'm with the city council. And it has been, it seems forever ago that many of us on the council were meeting with Trinitas representatives uh, at the very start of this project. It's made some incredible changes since you got started and we've had a little pandemic that has uh, uh, been in between us here. So I don't know if I've met with, with any of you here or if there have been complete turnover of staff. I think I remember meeting with someone named Kimberly. Is she still with you? Uh, you don't have to answer that question. But um, my question has to do with the issue of the differences between the student housing and the multifamily housing and the issue of affordability. Because I think early on, we were talking about the possibility of taking advantage of our affordability incentives. And I don't know if that's completely dead in the water at this point, or if there's still the possibility to maybe include some of that, at least in the multifamily aspect of this. Um, of course, there, the incentive actually allows you to add an additional floor uh, in, in, in exchange for the public benefit of some of those units in that multifamily being, you know, coming in at a more affordable, less than market rate. So just a question, this may be again for Mr. Call or, or uh, Mark Vetcher. Um, yep, Mark, hi. Um, to just kind of address what happened with that and, and it was the incentive not enough to make this worth your while. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Mark. You should be able there. You go, Mark. Yeah, thank you very much for the uh, for the question. Um, I think that's one that we've um, talked about amongst ourselves and and looked through uh, as this project has gone through many different iterations um, over the years. So, um, a couple things with regards to that is um, on the affordable housing side, we have looked at whether this could have um, uh, could be used for affordable housing for LIHTC or low income, low income housing tax credits. Um, unfortunately, this is not in a qualified census track, which makes it um, not likely that it would be approved for um, the affordable housing tax credits for either the 9% deals or the 4% deals. And the affordable housing is really on, on a standalone basis is really only feasible with a public subsidy um, so that because we're not, um, it's not on that qualified census track, it really is not feasible for, um, for an independent low-income housing um, building. So we did look at that. Um, with regards to the density bonus, I think that's a great question as well. Um, we had looked at whether it makes sense to include the density bonus um, and include affordable housing. One thing that we had also taken from um, the shred that we had done, you know, a few years ago was we had come back, I think, with a more um, intensive and more dense plan. And one thing that was we heard clear from the uh, community was that having a less intensive and less dense use was probably more favorable um, as opposed to that. So we looked at what was allowable by the uh, current UDO. And when we looked at our program, there really wasn't a need to go above what was allowed by the UDO. So in this case, the density bonus really wasn't something that um, was advantageous for us to use for, for our program. So, um, so in the end, that's where we landed with that. Okay, so if I could follow up. Um, so you were hearing from the public with the with all the many charrettes that I know you you um, you held 
that they were more concerned about this being overly occupied with respect to perhaps traffic concerns or congestion. And so therefore, um, you decided not to take advantage of the, uh, the density bonus for affordability and just thought keeping the project at a smaller scale. Did I hear that correctly? Yeah, I think that's one of the definitely one of the considerations was that I think when we had looked at this initially, we had looked at a, a you know much higher buildings and and some more density. But as we went through the program, and then also you know having a, a, a global pandemic also forced us to look at um, you know what was what was feasible and what we thought would be um, would be workable and, and financeable as well. And all that came to. Um, basically using letting us use what was allowable with the existing UDO and take advantage of the UDO and all the you know the great things that it has been uh, that has been put in there I think Ryan had outlined a lot of those aspects that um, that were that we're using into making this uh, what we think is a, is a really exciting development um, but that's where we landed. Okay, thank you. And of course, this is a site plan discussion, but I would also have an interest, I think it was part of the first part of my question about the bedroom configurations between uh, what the formula will be with the student side and then also with the multifamily or what those bedroom um, uh, formulas are going to look like. And we can perhaps discuss that at our next meeting, but thank you. Okay. Yeah, and and I think um, I saw that Aaron Bartels with Trinitas as well um, did have his hand raised too. If there was something that he wanted to add, or maybe it was a a, a miss hand raise. He should be able to unmute. Okay. No, I'm good. I did not raise my hand, but thanks, Mark. Okay, sorry. Maybe a uh, holdover on my on my screen. Thank you. All right, Commissioner St. John. Thank you, um, and thank you to the petitioner for bringing, looks like at least five people here, so it's great. Thank you, really appreciate all your um, entertaining our questions. I had two questions. A lot of my questions have been asked by commissioners, so thank you to uh, Commissioner Sandberg and Commissioner Kinsey for covering some of those. Um, the space that is not developed now, um, I don't remember, I think it's on the Northwest corner that could maybe be developed in the future. Where does that fall in the 60 40 split? So that's a great question. Uh, and that was one of the, the head scratchers that we, we put a lot of work into. Uh, the interesting thing is the Bloomington, I'm uh, sorry, the Blooming Foods parking lot is one of the biggest challenges in the project because it represents such a large surface area of impervious material. It's also pretty essential for a grocery store to have a nice surface parking lot when you're carting your stuff out to the car. So uh, the way we looked at it is that uh, we wanted to have the opportunity for a retail component, uh, maybe small F, you know, food and beverage or something at some point in the future. Uh, but we figured, and this is part of a, uh, it's not illustrated, but it was thinking that came from the Shred. We had a more slightly more intensive retail environment closer to Third Street which is kind of a natural place for it. Um, but as long as Blooming Foods is doing well and is in that spot, and if our project supports it and it's doing well, then that surface parking lot and the Blooming Foods needs to remain. Um, if at some point in time, Blooming Foods reconfigures into a, a, a more urban footprint or a different kind of mixed use project, and that site redevelops and they tackle the 60-40 impervious pervious requirement on that site, then all of a sudden there's bandwidth. Uh, we'll have more uh, landscape area to work with, which will then free up the replacement of that green lawn area with a building to hold the corner with a, with a retail presence. So that's, it's kind of a phase project phasing question. We just ran out of, um, we didn't have enough landscape area to get that building in at this phase. So, so is that, green lawn area in the northwest corner is that in the 60 or in the 40 currently it's so, included it helps us get right up to the 40, to the 40. Um, okay need, so in the we, drawings it looks like it's contained in like the lines around the building i uh, i think you might be referring to the block exhibit i could see that okay. um in person yeah so if um let me see i'll just bring up the plan again if you don't Mind. Uh, so this lawn area, which uh, I, that's what we're talking about, right? Uh, yeah. This, you know, until until this large 
you know, this is very much kind of a setback to um, the project in terms only of impervious pervious. Uh, so at some point, say this redevelops into a mixed use building with a retail component uh, and the, the need for a surface parking lot is either satisfied through structured parking or some other means, um, then, uh, you know, we're in theory, they apply the 6040 calculation on their site, which means we don't have to account for it. Right now, this is doing some of the heavy lifting to help allow that large surface parking okay. lot. So. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, that's helpful. Yeah. And my second question is um, the parking garage and mm -hmm. what you can do to make that. Um, hmm, I was going to say something that wasn't super nice that you can do to make them more attractive. I was going to say less ugly, but more attractive. Well, because honestly, I don't know, and and maybe maybe um, staff can say this. I don't know if there's a parking garage on the east side of town at all, so other than on campus. So this might uh, correct me if I'm wrong, um, Jackie. This might be the first parking garage on the east, what we would call here as like the east side of town, um, and it yes, seems like I think that's accurate. Yeah, it seems and like it. Yeah. We're going to have to keep talking about it. Yeah. Basically. So yeah. I would be curious what just, I know you're, you're um, just sort of thinking about ideas. I'd kind of be curious to hear what some of those are. Yeah. This is, yeah. If I could jump in real quick and then maybe we can get um, into some of the architecture too. Um, but from, from our side, just some kind of a high level as far as the, you know, the parking garage and, and what our overall thought process for that was is, one of the things that we're trying to understand as well is just what the need for cars is going to be in the future. So as part, you know, as parking requirements go down, as more people use alternative transportation, as Uber and Lyft and ride share and those kind of things continue to grow as the city's bike lanes um, continue to expand as well. We're not sure what the, you know, entire parking um, requirement is going to be. So one of the things that we've looked at that is for us to consolidate all of our parking or the majority of our parking there, and then also be able to use that as potential future redevelopment opportunity sometime down the road when um, there isn't uh, that amount of parking needed for the entire project. So um, it was kind of one of those things where as we're looking at where do we allocate resources for the project, we wanted to be able to allocate resources in place that we really thought that it would matter as far as bike lanes, infrastructure, those kind of things, and maybe not limit some of our resources, but we didn't want to throw throw resources at something that we thought could be redeveloped in the future. So that was part of our just kind of big picture thinking so that you can understand a little bit of our thought process for that, is that that could be a future redevelopment opportunity just as you know the need for cars shakes out and, um, and if that's going to be needed in the future. The, the one thing I would add to that, Mark, is uh, from a site planning perspective, we did tuck it um, in the kind of inside corner of the shopping center so that, you know, from the south, it's mostly screened by the Macy's um, facility and its, its, its area. And then it's next to the side of the target, which is fairly, you know, kind of a blank wall facade. So, it, you know, that, that was kind of uh, what we could do on a site planning level. But I, yeah, the, this, as uh, as it was said, the con the discussion on the parking garage will continue. So, okay, great. I think if um, you do have an opportunity um, within your planning and budget to do even some kind of art on one side of that, uh, much like or or much like the effort, not necessarily the art that is going into the parking garages downtown, um, that could actually mean a lot. That one side facing target, although it is a target parking garage, is a super busy area with people yeah. coming and going. And you certainly can see it from, from that target side. And who knows what's gonna happen with the Macy's building. That could be something in the future. You know, Maybe Macy's parking lot becomes a park or something and there's mm -hmm. this parking garage. So if you had an opportunity to put some art, that would be awesome. But thank you, I appreciate those answers. Thank you, Commissioner Kate. Thanks uh, very much to the, the petitioners um, and to the prior questions from the commissioners as well. I, I totally second uh, Commissioner St. John's 
uh, comment about the public art and if that is a way to, uh, to address um, some of your thinking as well, which is, you know, maybe this will get redeveloped in some way, but if that's a way to uh, kind of you know, make that more attractive in the interim, that would be movable or preservable in some meaningful way, even if got redeveloped, that would be terrific. My uh, question is actually about the buildings. And uh, Eric um, walked us through uh, all of the um, features that you were relying on in order to introduce modulation and visually kind of demask those buildings. And, uh, and by the way, let me say, generally, I think there's so much to like about this project. There are a lot of great things you've all been going through. Um, so it is exciting, but, but I, I will say that even with some of the modulation that's already been done on the buildings, they still feel somewhat monotonous to me when I look at them. And some of that, I wondered uh, whether it might be relieved by some changes in tone or color in there. So it looks a little bit less like one long kind of monolithic um, building and a little bit more like a, you know, almost, almost townhousey, but something like that. Is that something that you all have explored or talked about? Mark, uh, I mean, the, the scale is, is so important in this project and, uh, you know, creating kind of a, a medley of buildings, which is somewhat of what you're alluding to, I think, uh, is really important. Uh, the, the fine balance that we're trying to strike is, you know, clearly we, we don't want something that looks forced or, you know, or trying to emulate something that was from the past when there was a much finer grain grid. Um, but it would be interesting to, to, to try some of the idea, you know, we didn't, we honestly didn't uh, study what you just mentioned, which is a variation in the tone. Uh, we do have, you know, the multifamily buildings were inten intentionally a different roof form and a different uh, material mm -hmm. color uh, and some different patterning and different windows. Uh, the unit sizes in those are different too, which creates a different kind of rhythm of windows. And when you look at the, um, the combination of those buildings on Clariz, you'll see both, you'll always see multiple buildings from any vantage point. So that, that part helps break up some of that monotony that you might be experiencing. But I think we can certainly look at tone and explore that idea at least. Uh, Dan, I should not speak for all the architecture, uh, please. <laughs> this is your wonderful work. So uh, feel free to add. He might be muted. Oh, I, yeah, I think you're muted. No, I, I think that was well said. That's an important question, and, and I agree with what Ryan just said. It's not something we've specifically studied yet, but it's certainly something we, we could take a look at to, to help with what you're talking about. Thank you. Okay, additional questions. Um, Commissioner Burrell, go ahead. Uh, going back to the garage, uh, what is the uh, ratio between between car and bedrooms or car and people uh, that you have arrived at this point? How many parking spots? How many? Yeah, know? it's um, well, it's it's interesting. The UDO was actually really flexible in that, which was a, a big benefit for us because we have pushed the parking supply for the residential. Uh, into a, a very kind of bus transit walking oriented. Uh, so we have, you know, for the number of units and uh, Blooming Foods, uh, which is a grocery store, we needed to maintain the Blooming, Fields park, uh, Blooming Foods parking count. And so there are uh, 92 parking spaces uh, and some of the surface parking serves the residential, but there are 92 parking spaces that serve Blooming Foods, which is what they have today. And so when you take that and subtract that out of the 500 and I think it was 42, 542 spaces, uh, we're in the 400 range for the units and, and the bed count. Uh, Mark, Aaron, a lot of that uh, came with a lot of study and debate from Trinitas. Do you want to kind of expand on how you guys arrived at your parking ratio? Yeah, uh, you guys can still hear me, correct? Yeah, so I think Ryan, thanks for explaining that. I think that the um, the numbers itself, uh, I think for the UDO, 
is um, right around a half a um, 0.5 spaces per student family um, housing bedroom. And, and that's basically what we um, looked at as far as the parking ratio for that. And then we had additional spaces. While there's not any um, parking ratio required for the multifamily, we continued that um, as far as what the parking ratio, if you look at it, um, on a on a per bed basis for parking, um, it's a similar ratio. So even though there's not any parking that's required for the UDO for the multifamily, we did want to make sure that there is parking included. Um, so that's uh, I think that's where the parking ratio and or is. And as we've got approximately 442 spaces then that are for the residential when you back out the Blooming Foods parking count. The other. Uh you know, a component to add is that we've decoupled the rent from the parking space. So if you choose not to own a car, you are not forced to rent a parking space for that car. So it's uh, it's optional. And so there's, uh, there's the optionality to that. Great, thank you. Additional questions uh, from commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Seabor, go ahead. Thank you. And, and like others have said, I think there's a lot of great things as a part of this project, but also I think some opportunities to consider some additional enhancements. And um, so I've got a, a few questions I want to ask, and maybe one just in the petitioner presentation, I heard a lot of reference to like the term public open space or even parks, um, but just wanted some clarification on if these open green spaces would be truly available and open to the public or if they would be um, limited in some way. The courtyards, uh, the, so so the, uh, the student dormitories, you'll notice that, they, that those buildings form two courtyards and those courtyards are secured and for the residents only. Uh, but Frida Park and Latimer Park uh, don't have any fences or gates or, or anything like that. Uh, they will remain private property. And, uh, you know, there's the ability that, you know, in that term for the, uh, the owner to maintain them, uh, to keep an eye on them, make sure they're safe for their standards of safety. Uh, but there are no barriers to people occupying those spaces. Yeah. And the same is true with the transit plaza. That's, um, at the corner near Target, so. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in here too, is that that park that's at the um, at the rear of the property, or I guess the south side of the property, is um, roughly the size of the football field. So just to give kind of a size um, uh, scale, we've done some, um, Josh has done a great job of, of breaking it down so it doesn't feel cavernous and has a lot of different elements to it. Um, but just as a point of reference, as far as kind of the overall, when you look at building to building and build to building the street, it is the size of, of a football field that's there. So we're really excited about just the size and the number of different things that we can have um, be incorporated into that. So I think that's going to be just a, a really neat park. And I know we're really excited about the directions that, that Josh is looking at and how to um, have both program space and then also open space that can be free and flexible for, you know, whoever the user is. Right. I appreciate those responses. And I guess just to follow a little comment on it, just to ask for consideration of potential like commitments to them being available to the public or especially for like the transit space that maybe there's a transit easement or something to, to make sure that is maintained over time. But um, maybe moving to another question, I heard some good conversations about the benefits of smaller block sizes. Um, and I think this project certainly is achieving a lot of that, especially when you're looking at uh, from a north to south perspective. Um, but when you look east to west through the site, they're really I guess I'm struggling to see them as separate blocks um, and it kind of maybe gets a little bit to the traffic question that we had earlier too about having alternative routes but some of those parallel roads just don't connect as there's a nice pedestrian connection um, which is certainly proposed but you know when I think of just pure from a technical perspective like how do you define what a block is like this is all one property um, so I, I just sort of wrestle with the, that the, some of those blocks maybe meeting the transportation plan um, 
recommended spacings? No, that's a really that's a really good question, and we spent a lot of time kind of figuring that out on our project. And actually, it kind of goes way back to the charrette. And the interesting thing when we started our charrette is we had um, a full street grid in the very first days of the charrette. We had a full street grid where we had a street all the way through in the middle, and then uh, Margaret Place and then Mary Agnes uh, up here. And uh, where the community landed was uh, we didn't need any more street stay lighting on the third street. And, uh, and then we also run into the challenge of connecting south to the mall ring road, which is owned by Simon, which is a private street. So where we landed was we would, you know, create the, as much permeability as possible from a pedestrian and a bike standpoint, but that we would focus cars really between Clarice and Kingston on Margaret place. Uh, this uh, street here, Mary Agnes that connects blooming foods, uh, and so it was kind of a hybrid of, it's not a full street grid in the sense of your downtown, uh, but, you know, the connections, you know, third street is a pretty busy arterial and then the mall ring road, we didn't have uh, control to, to tie into that. So th that's where some of that thinking came from, but in your transportation plan, Hunter Avenue, um, is really slated to, to drive across the mall at some point when it redevelops and connect to Clariz. And so what we did is we studied where the property, the parcels hit each other. And we took, um, and, and that was actually uh, west of, of College, uh, College Road, College Mall Road. So if you go west of College Mall Road and you look at where the parcels uh, come together, there's a real natural spot that almost um, aligns with um, Hunter. It's very close. And so we tracked that thinking that there would be a way to create that street at that parcel division. You tear down less buildings and you, you're, you, know, you have less land to acquire from the private landowners. And then took that line and carried it over to Clariz. And the, the benefit of that is if you took if you took Hunter straight across, it actually lands halfway between where we have um, Margaret Place and the, the Simon Mall Ring Road. And when you do that, you end up with a parcel, a really, you end up with a much larger block here, and then a block that was too small south of that. So we kind of detailed that in our planning submission. There's a page that you can uh, that I, I think Eric could help you find, or we'd be happy to send it, that kind of maps out where that geometry and street alignment uh, originated for Margaret Place. Um, does, that, does that help clarify? That, that helps. Um, and I, I guess just I really do appreciate like where, what you've done with Margaret Place. I think that that could potentially be a nice facility for, for this project and hopefully future projects, which maybe gets building on it a little bit is just maybe the question of subdivision. I think I heard until recently, I don't, I don't know what recently really means, but that the subdivision was a part of this project and that some of these roads would potentially become public. And I've honestly never heard of a developer wanting to keep roads private and not making the city maintain them. And so I'm just kind of curious, bigger picture. And as we talked about potentially blooming foods redeveloping in the future and you know, that's all one parcel and it gets complicated. And so I just, why is this project not proposing a subdivision or might it sometime in the future? And what about road maintenance and things? That just is very interesting to me that it's being what's proposed in that regard compared to what I've seen almost in every other project. Yeah, it's it was a long process. Uh, and I think what we came to was, uh, and, and one of the governing, not the only, but one of the major governing issues was in order for us to satisfy the 6040 impervious requirement, uh, it actually helped us to keep uh, blooming foods into the, the picture because um, and Jeff can, uh, Fanyo can elaborate on this just a little more, but um, we can offset the impact of that Blooming Food surface parking lot through uh, larger green spaces south of um, the, you know, the, this, this street right here. So we're kind of, you know, to keep that surface parking lot in place for Blooming Foods, you need some of the extra green uh, muscle <laughs> south, south of that street. So that... That was really, um, we, we went back and forth. And so I think, uh, Jeff, if there's not another 
governing thing. That was one of the primary ones I remember. Yeah, uh, when we were going through this, uh, it was made clear to us if we subdivided, each lot would have to stand on its own with the 6040 uh, impervious or landscape area to pervious, uh, impervious area. And because we, uh, Blooming Foods has a lease on the property, we, we don't have any authority to come in and make their lot compliant with the 6040. So it, we had to utilize the entire property uh, to be able to have it stand on its own using the green space uh, and landscape areas uh, to distribute it evenly across the site. And that was the reason not to subdivide at this time. But we'd have designed Marketplace and at Mary Agnes um, with a streetscape uh, 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 in accordance with the uh, uh, transportation plan. So that in the future, if something needs to be done, it can be. But in the meantime, it's, it's um, uh, going to be maintained by the uh, developer, which they have done in the past on uh, other projects they've done in Bloomington. Okay. I, I appreciate the explanation, um, I guess, for blooming foods to be maintained, I guess if it was to be subdivided, that would require potentially pursuing a variance or something along those lines. Um, and I guess at some point, I guess, what are the chances of this being subdivided in the future? And if that happens, does that then create non-compliant lots? Um, I'm just thinking ahead, or, or maybe it won't be subdivided, or if it isn't, like, um, could these uh, marketplace and others be preserved like through public access easements and things like that? I don't see that there's a need for f future subdivision, but let's say the city, for whatever reason, wanted to acquire one of these streets, it will be up to your standards, and it could be acquired if you, if you saw fit in the future. Uh, but there's no need from our standpoint to subdivide Yeah, Margaret Place actually has setbacks uh, that are not required on it because it's a private street, but we built them in just from a flexibility point of view. Uh, so I think your, your question as to is the thinking built into the site plan there that would permit future uh, uh, subdivision of the parcel? I believe so. Uh, but at this point in time, the... The, the most kind of logical and, and time efficient solution is for us to leave leave it all one and and offset really some of Blooming Food surface parking impact um, by over over landscaping south of that area. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll move maybe to just a couple other quicker I think questions, but um, and it maybe relates to to the on street parking spaces and whether they're public streets or private streets, like how that'll be in the parking garage to just wanting to understand how it will all be managed. Um, like if you have to pay to park in this garage, I'm going to guess that the on street parking spaces are gonna be in very high demand. Um, and I'm also just sort of along those lines, how like residential loading needs will be accommodated um, both when you move in and out or when I order all of those things off I order on Amazon, um, where those trucks are going to park. I imagine not in the garage and probably not up in Blooming Foods and the mall probably isn't going to want it. So I'm just curious how parking and loading will be managed. Mark, do you want to tackle the operational questions? Yeah, I think um, those are some great questions that, that we're um, uh, working through our, uh, ourselves is the district garage so the district garage will be a, a you know paid parking for the residents so that will be a, a private garage for the residents um the um i think the deliveries that you're discussing as well as um those are those are actually items that we've been talking about ourselves as far as a design team as far as you know just how do we do curb management here so how do we have areas that have um uh, Uber and Lyft drop off, Grubhub, Amazon, all those kind of things, so that we can manage that correctly, so that it's not causing traffic issues or safety issues. So, um, 
so that's all stuff that you know is evolving and we're working on on getting our arms around that as well as far as what we think appropriate amounts of that and where would be appropriate to have those um so i think those are all questions that, that we're continuing to work on and continuing to refine and i think you you definitely brought up a, a really good point with that because that is something that we're continuing to work on Cool. If, if more information could be maybe shared at the next meeting, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Just a topic I'm interested in. And, and, and so I'll go to maybe my last question, and it re is regarding the Blooming Food site. And um, it looks like that that, I'll call it that parcel, even though it's all one, um, has what I would, looks like four driveways onto the street. And, you know, if this was a street, they would only be allowed two. And some of those driveways are for the parking lot and some of it's for trucks. And it just sounds like it could be confusing and it's not interconnected. Um, just how will that be managed or, you know, can they be convinced? How, I'm just a little more detail on that part of the site layout. Andrew, I might try to answer that. Um, what we've tried to create is a workable solution for the back of house of Blooming Foods where they have their deliveries and their trash pickup. And in that situation, because of the dimensions of the existing facility, a one way in, a one driveway will not work for them to circulate. And the same thing is for the uh, parking lot. We look at that as a separate facility where you have a way in, you could, you could have th uh, through travel and come back out. You can go down each parking aisle and not have a dead end and have to back out if all the spaces are filled. So what we did is created a, a cord, corridors that work for each side of the, the Blooming Foods' traf traffic, the uh, truck and uh, trash part of it, and then the vehicle access. And it's going to be a huge improvement over the system that they have now, which is really a free-for-all and in conflicting uh, parking lot striping. I happen to shop there and I, I see the old striping, I see the new striping, and it's just a hodgepodge. And this is gonna be a much better, well-managed uh, parking scheme than what they have now. And, it, and we're maintaining the number of, same number of parking spaces, but increasing the uh, landscaping areas significantly over what they have. Thanks, Jeff. I, I agree in that. Uh, addresses my last question. I think just big picture, I think that there are a lot of good things that are coming from this and I certainly appreciate it. Um, just as much as things can be done even better to meet, you know, whatever we can accomplish the better. But thank you guys. Thank you. All right, thank you. I believe uh, Commissioner Herrera was next. Yeah, and thank you. Um, yeah, I have two questions in this regarding. Um, we have been mentioning the open space, the, the park, the access to the park. And I, um, I'm just thinking if uh, there was any kind of consideration for um, offering amenities uh, for uh, the, the numerous families that uh, this project will bring or the preference is just to have the, uh, the park, as you were mentioning, just to, to access walk and, 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 and relax or uh, any possibility of more offering for, for children and families. And going back, my second question is regarding the uh, certification with the, um, um, the comment about not aiming to the elite uh, uh, platino or or the highest certification, and I'm just wondering what what's the certification? Uh, it's aiming or 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 a, a, a desirable, and in in and also what of the requirements from EC the Environmental Commission. Uh, could be some kind of uh, negotiable or, or maybe in the future could be a, a try. Mark, there are several questions in that. Um, yeah, you want why yeah, why don't we um, uh, work through some of the, or talk through some of the um, parking or the park questions first. Um, and I'm not sure if Josh is on, I know he had to run to something um, real quick, but 
Uh, Josh, if you're on the line, I may have you talk through some of the just overall programming of Latimer Park. And, and I think in general, too, what we've done is looked at Frida Park is more of a, you know, kind of linear park that's a little bit more quiet, uh, less programmed. Latimer Park as something that has more programming that is uh, included in it so that there is, you know, because it is such a vast expanse that it um, has different programmed areas, but then also has um, has freedom to be able to have just some non-programmed um, in, uh, you know, places where you can have a lawn to run around a little bit and, uh, and have some openness. Um, Josh, are you around to maybe give a little bit more detail on that? Sorry, I may have missed the question. I had to run down to answer the door for the utility guys. I apologize. Can, can you repeat it real quick and I can answer? What's the programming on Latimer Park? The question is, uh, we've got, uh, you know, how do we appeal to multiple age groups, kids, seniors, different things like that? Right. Okay, yeah, I can't answer that. So that was uh, one of the reasons that we designed the, um, and I don't know if my mouse is showing up, but if you look at the two wedges on the east side with the center point in between, we kind of designed this whole thing to contain multiple age groups. So the play areas on the north and south side, yes, they are designed mostly for children, but not exclusively for children. Um, so those walkways, they're a place to meander, but it's also highly vegetated in there to be um, somewhat contemplative. But then in the center, you have the, um, the general seating area. We actually built in um, the grill stations there, and there's, there's picnic tables for uh, multiple age groups. And then on the west end, there are two wedges where we have kind of these little items in the landscape. And, and the intention is that they would be the, oh. some, yeah, somewhat whimsical so that they provide almost a, an art-like experience if you're not a child, but then for child, they're like the stepping stone uh, type of style. So um, it was intentionally designed. It's hard to design something that is flexible for a ton of age groups, but we did um, make our best effort to do that in, in that space. So, you know, you'll see some of the features here. This, th this rendering uh, doesn't have all of the landscape elements built into it. It was more of a general rendering, but you'll notice that there are swings that are, you know, the, that become the, the bridge point between the outdoor uh, barbecue and the, the, the big lawn. Uh, the, the whimsical, uh, you know, sculptural elements are built into the landscape at the edges on these two sides, flaking this um, kind of gathering area here. And then the meandering paths through the forest that uh, Josh was describing are these wedges over here and that. So that's uh, meant to appeal to different scales of groups as well. There's areas for large families to, to, to get together or there's a place where a couple could enjoy a stroll and, and, and feel like they have some peace and quiet to themselves. I think uh, your other questions were in regards to the, the lead uh, aspect of the building. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, that was something uh, suggested or recommended, but uh, uh, we could hear that uh, it's not the, uh, the station, and maybe I'm wrong here, to get that uh, a higher certification. So I'm wondering, based on the recommendation from, from the uh, Environmental Commission, what would be the, the, the certification or uh, how the things that were recommended, the, 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 you as a, as a petitioner could work on or might in certain way uh, fulfill? Dan or Mark, do you want to yeah. tackle that? Yeah, I, and I can pass it over to Dan too. Um, I, I think you're right. It, it's not our intention to go through any sort of certification process with this. I think there's a lot of things that um, that it, it could qualify for, but the intention is not to go through that certification process. Um, and I think too, we can continue evolving um, and looking at what those, um, you know, green building practices are that we can make sure that we're included beyond, you know, including the ones that Dan had mentioned earlier. Um, as I'd said, a lot of our uh, things that we're really excited about come from the site and the site plan um, and making that a, um, a sustainable site plan. Uh, and then we'll continue to work uh, and understand 
um, what aspects you know could be brought into the building before. So Dan, if you've got any other comments to that, um, feel free. No, I think I think that's a pretty fair analysis so far. I know once you get into the buildings in detail, and we're not there yet, frankly, in the in the interior design, you start to get into some of the more um, nuts and bolts and some of the other uh, items that you that you'd see appear in a lead checklist. But we've tried to hit the ones that we've designed to so far: site design, site design as it reflects to um, building positioning and massing and exterior materials, exterior configuration. We've tried to adopt those those practices so far. Like Mark said, we'll try and continue to look for every opportunity um, to look for those that that we can apply sensibly to it too. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for, for your answers. All right, thank you. Any other questions from commissioners? All right. Um, seeing none, I think it's time for public comment. So uh, we'll move now to public comment. And if you would like to make public comment, uh, look to the bottom of your screen uh, and either under the participants tab or the reactions tab, you should find a button to raise hand. Uh, if you raise your hand, we will uh, recognize you when it is your turn uh, to speak. Uh, five minutes to make your comment. Um, this is not uh, a time for uh, question and answer, uh, but if there are any questions raised, we will do our best to get answers before we uh, adjourn the meeting. Um, uh, if you have any trouble finding that raise button, uh, raise hand button, you can also just send a chat to uh, one of the hosts and we'll do our best to, to make sure that you're recognized. So uh, with that, Jackie, um, who do we have? Sure. First, we have Steve Akers. You should be able to unmute, Steve. Hi, folks. It's Steve. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. I'm Steve Akers from Park Ridge neighborhood, and I'm in the neighborhood that's just across the street from this development. Uh, Let's see. Okay. Uh, let's see. First, I, I just like to say uh, I'm I'm kind of I, I missed the meeting that was I guess last month, so I'm a little bit at a disadvantage. But I, I have to admit I'm sh kind of shocked. And I know we've had a pandemic since we met at Benford School when we had the charrette. Uh, many of us spent a lot of time with you folks offering ideas and this development looks nothing like what we thought was <laughs> that we had developed. I mean, not even close. Uh, I understand you don't want retail, you know, with the pandemic that has changed our landscape, but no hotel, no owner occupied, no retail, uh, just very, very different, really just a glorified student, uh, student housing area really is what we've come up with. Uh, and yet another, sorry to say, uninspiring boxy building that's going to be in there. I am inspired by the green space. That's great. But, but again, just another boxy building that we're going to add to Bloomington. And boy, have we got our share of them. Um, let's see. I'd like to say, uh, if you could, and I know the, the commissioner seem a little bit shy. I know this is before the June 4th meeting. So there's still some planning to be done and some uh, more ideas to come up. But in terms of sustainable ideas, uh, sustainable uh, input, uh, I, I think we need to, and commissioners and planning staff, we need to ask for more than just shade and recycling asphalt. We need, uh, you know, some not expensive, but solar array on the roofs or garage to uh, power hopefully some some uh, charging stations for cars uh, as well as lighting that's on site. Uh, I think we need to ask for some sort of water capturing system that could be on the roofs uh, that could water the grounds uh, and so that the, 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 the uh, development could take care of itself in that way. Uh, in terms of green space, uh, I think it would be nice to have more uh, native plants and things instead of just bushes and not big large grass areas. So water gardens, again, not a real expensive thing to do um, uh, because this, this is going to be used by families and students and we want to influence those students uh, to not just go out and have this 
big green grass lawns, but rather something interesting. Um, I, I have to say, again, this is another, this is for the commissioners, another loss opportunity for affordable housing. I'm glad Susan brought up uh, potentially that we could have had some affordable housing, but again, we've missed that, missed that boat, it looks like. Uh, on the garage side, in terms of artistic renderings, we've got lots of local artists uh, where we could have something interesting on the sides of the garages uh, that we've done that we have planned for the fourth street garage. The fourth street garage is going to have massive art installations and charging stations and all kinds of interesting things. So at least there's a template there you could take a look at. And, um, I know that this is early, but hopefully when we get into the discussion of, uh, the uh, rooms and the appliances and things like that, that we will get into more of the energy star rated things and uh, uh, something that's, you know, that's not going to use a lot of energy thinking about 900 students. Wow. That's, that's a lot of beds uh, that's going to spill out on, into this area. And uh, if they can be, if they can conserve energy and not everyone should have a car and things like that, that would be a, a plus. So I, I understand that there's still some work to be done and that there's going to be another hearing. I think you said June, I think it was June 4th. So that's good to hear. Uh, I don't know if it's even possible because a lot of you, uh, the planner, the CSO folks are up in India, but some of you are out of state. If there would be an opportunity to have some kind of, um, believe it or not, in-person gathering, just to look at the artistic renderings a little bit more, at least once before the June 4th, I think it would make many of us feel better. We, you know, we'd like to see this area develop, but boy, let's develop it right. And because it's going to be here for a long time, we hope. And uh, it's in a very important space uh, with, you know, lots of residential around it as well as retail. So it could be something really special. So let's take that opportunity to create something like that. Uh, I think that's it. I'll, I'll uh, let go of the rest of my time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Who's next, Jackie? Sorry, next we have Barbara Moss. Okay, um, can you folks hear me? Yes, we can. Uh -oh. oh, good. <laughs> um, you know, this was introduced as the construction of a multifamily residential development, but um, Steve kind of brought this up just now, but a critical fact about this is that it hasn't actually been highlighted is in fact that it, it really is more or less, um, you know, another very large student housing project. And one of the commissioners um, early on indicated that next week, you know, you'd get to look more, perhaps more at the numbers, but it actually is in the materials. It's right out there. Um, it's a total of 906 bedrooms uh, proposed and 617 are allocated specifically to student housing. So that means actually a full 68%, 68% of this development is student housing. Um, and um, I'm not sure that this is quite hit home for the plan commission or for the public. And as Steve said, we, we did have charrettes. We talked about lots of different uses and, and, and you folks served very nice food and drink. And it was, it was kind of, a, you know, fun interactive sessions, but what's come back um, hasn't really reflected a lot of the things that we had discussed. And I understand that you did make it much smaller or, or considerably smaller, and, and I appreciate that. And I understand also that as a developer, you know, you're going to be looking at um, the most, um, uh, you know, the, the, the highest, um, uh, geez, I'm losing, I'm losing my words here, um, possible return on your investment. But I would just ask the, the, the plan commission to look at, uh, if, is there some way to uh, have the developer um, put some more missing middle housing, which is a very important uh, issue in front of us right now. 
Uh, and if we if they can incorporate more of it, uh, it, it might not be at the very highest level of a return on investment, but it could be a good return nonetheless. And I, I think that's much more your responsibility to ask those questions uh, than perhaps it is the developer to, to come up with that, uh, especially in light of the fact that, that this is right off um, the bypass. And uh, we're gonna be about three minutes from uh, the new uh, brand new very large hospital site. So those folks are gonna really very much need housing. Um, and uh, additionally, it would be nice as, as uh, 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 Commissioner Sandberg mentioned uh, to bring back some affordable housing as well. But even aside from that, uh, the, the missing middle is, is critical and this is such a, a, a real opportunity for that. So I hope you can, you can look at that. Uh, missing middle aspect as opposed to the massive amount of new student housing. And we're not even really sure that so much of the other student housing we have uh, in other places is, is being occupied to the extent, you know, to full extent or even close to that, such as Smallwood downtown. Um, additionally, I'd like to say I heartily agree with Commissioner Kate um, about um, the way that, you know, the architecture and how these uh, buildings are going to look. From th Third Street, I'm afraid they're going to look like all the other massive student boxes that we see all over Bloomington. There needs to be a, a lot more variety and I'm glad to hear the willingness of the developers to look at that more. Uh, one, uh, one person who is an architect, Jim Rosenbarger, quickly reviewed uh, these, these drawings because as you may or may not know, we only had five hours notice about this meeting. Um, Steve Akers had asked about it, uh, and I had also asked about it probably you know, two, three weeks ago and told it would be sometime in May. My impression was that somebody would get back, but nobody did. And it was only this morning after a couple of times asking that Steve was told it would be today. So we literally had five hours notice, which is really not the way things should go. But in any case, the architect looked at this, Jim Rosenbarger, and his comment was, uh, I'll, I'm quoting, by monotonously following zoning's anti-monotony rules, the result is extremely monotonous. Uh, maybe I missed something, but I didn't see variation in building types, row houses, et cetera. Uh, the overall plan is inward oriented, except for the parking garages on a corner. And this does not seem to reflect good urbanism. So uh, I, I would hope that that really can, um, can be looked at as well. And in terms of the, uh, the public spaces, the park is, is very nice. It, it maybe is not quite as, as large as most uh, people might think from looking at the drawings and sort of the wide angle uh, way things are drawn because it's, it's only uh, an, an acre park. And many homes um, are, especially in the neighborhood that is close to Hoosier Acres, where I live, are basically uh, an acre. So it's not a massive park. And I, I would hope that there would be some places where people could sit. I haven't seen a lot of that. Um, and I think I'm out of time. So those are my comments. And thank you for giving me the opportunity. Thank you. Next, we have Margaret Clements. Hello, this is Margaret Clements, and I uh, would urge you to reject this plan. Don't make special exceptions for this PUD to allow more, yet more student housing in our community. I don't think we've fully come to terms yet with the number of uh, units that are under shovel, that are being built. I mean, I discover one just driving down the street like almost every single day. And, um, I really think that we're competing with even the very notion of the university. And I'm sure that Commissioner Kinsey knows this very well, that faculty-student interaction and is very important for student success. And to farm out this many students into the city is not healthy in um, a town our size. And it actually thwarts the mission of the university. Um, Keep it commercial if you can't do anything like single family housing and also uh, the scale of it, the scale of four story buildings and these uh, one story um, 
neighborhoods. It's too much. And that property is going is important to our city, and we don't need more student housing. I just can't emphasize that uh, strongly enough. We just do not need more student housing. So uh, the role of the plan commission, in my view, is to really help the city and the um, council members uh, envision a city that's thriving viable and sustainable. And there's really nothing in this uh, proposal that that does addresses any of those features. I don't even know, for instance, in student housing complexes, if uh, recycling pertains. I mean, if we are interested in the uh, climate and we only are creating rental housing, I mean, we're really adding to the trash heap of history in so many ways that uh, we aren't even discussing or contemplating. So um, I just, it's not needed. The scale is too big. Keep it commercial um, unless you can do something to fill the need, uh, the growing need for uh, additional single family housing. That's my advice. And thank you for letting me speak tonight. Thank you. Any additional public comment? Jackie? No. I, think I see one I more. Don't see. Oh, yeah. Uh, I see one more hand, Bruce. Yep. Lucy Shake. Hi. Um, I, I'm Lucy Shake. I live in the Park Ridge neighborhood across the street from the proposed area. And I just wanted to. Um, I'm not going to talk for five minutes. I just wanted to say that this, like Steve, that this is a very different uh, looking proposal than what we saw before. Um, like Barbara, we had about five hours to know that this meeting was happening. That's hardly enough to even inform our neighbors. The very network that you say is going to be essential to, you know, conditional uh, information of neighbors and, and invested people. Um, we didn't have enough time to tell anybody about this meeting happening. And I feel that isn't really uh, the way that we should be doing business. Um, I'm also concerned about this being, as in your words, student dormitory buildings. Uh, why do we need student dormitory buildings in the entryway to our town on Third Street? Um, it just doesn't make sense, especially when 38% of those are gonna be four and five bedroom units. That's, that's not, friendly to the area that we're in. We have a lot of student housing over here. Um, I think what we want to be focusing on is affordable housing, workforce housing, community housing. This would just be another lost opportunity uh, of space that's already connected by transit, space that's connected. To, it's not a food desert over here for sure. We got about four grocery stores you can walk to. Why would you say that this is a green uh, transit friendly space when you're putting what a hundred and, uh, I don't know what it was, like 182 bike parking spaces for 906 bedrooms? <laughs> How is that incentivizing alternative transportation? That doesn't make any sense. I, I think you can do better than this. I think uh, also blaming the people at the charrette for getting rid of affordability is just kind of a low blow. Um, we were asking for community housing. We were asking for workforce housing. We were asking for housing for people who are downsizing. The first things that we saw, the things that were put on the board were townhouses, uh, spaces that were really family friendly. Those were all taken away. Those aren't there anymore. And we didn't reduce it from the proposed 11 stories on the back of this lot to four stories. And somehow that's our fault that you can't, Matt, you can't include affordability. So I think that's, Kind of a low blow to add that in there. Um, I think we can do better with this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we have um, Ron Smith has messaged that he would like to comment. Just a second. Should be ready to go, Ron. Thank you, Ms. Scanlon. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Yes? Okay. Um, the, uh, the plan is just, um, 
it hasn't responded to the constituents um, who have uh, beginning in the end of 2019 with the charrettes and a couple meetings over at Blooming Foods, um, there was a real desire to mitigate um, student housing and or eliminate it altogether. And uh, I've met with Trinitas a couple times and, you know, uh, nice folks and all, but this is not a response to what the public is asking for. You know, the modular designs, it looks like it's, it's gonna be buildings that could be on IU campus um, with these giant modular buildings. Um, they look like they're gonna be designed after the Patterson Drive uh, where there's some houses, there's some colors changed and a few windows changed. Um, you know, we don't need any more student housing. Um, we do need missing middle we need affordable housing for people. Um, Trentas has been told this uh, for a year and a half. And um, it's just disappointing that this is, this is what they come up with. Um, you know, and I asked the plan commission, is this what you, you want to approve um, in the face of the public saying that they don't want it? That, that it needs to be different to um, mitigate some of the effects. Uh, we didn't hear about uh, how do they mitigate the effects if there are students there. What about the noise? What about the traffic? Those issues. That's what the neighborhood told us at the Charettes and at the meetings at Blooming Foods. So it's real disappointing um, when it doesn't appear we need student housing. Uh, we need affordable housing and uh, you know, we need, we need Trinitas and the plan commission to listen to the people in the neighborhood uh, like uh, Mr. Akers and um, um, Barbara Moss. I mean, these are people who are gonna be affected. And so um, as the city council representative of that area, I, I really want you to take it seriously and, and, and Trinitas as well, and at least respond somehow to the public who is really worried about um, more student housing right there when it doesn't appear that we need it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there any additional public comment? I don't see any hands raised. I don't, I don't have see any. All right, last call for public comment. Once again, if you'd like to make comment, just click on participants or the reactions uh, button on your screen. Look for the raise hand button uh, or send a direct chat to myself or to Jackie. Ah, I see one more hand just raised. Russ Skiba just raised his hand. Mr. Skiba. Yes, hi, I'm Russ Skiba. I'm in the Hoosier Acres uh, neighborhood. We would be the direct neighbors for 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 this new development. Uh, I'm not going to speak very long except to say that I think that um, uh, neighbors uh, of in both uh, the neighborhoods nearest to this development, uh, Hoosier Acres and Park Ridge, are very much disappointed um, by uh, the way uh, this plan has developed. When it was uh, first presented, there was um, uh, an emphasis or, or there was some uh, affordable housing uh, and the neighbors were very clear about uh, not wanting student housing. Uh, you know, it's, it's become um, very clear at the um, city council meetings and the plan commissions before that about the upzoning uh, and, and the need for affordable housing. This has been uh, something that I think both sides can agree on. We have uh, those supporting the upzoning uh, who are saying, you know, housing in, in, in Bloomington is just not affordable. How are we uh, who are just starting out our careers ever going to, to find um, an affordable house? And that rents are going up and we need 
we need to, to ensure um, affordability there as well. Um, on the other side, uh, you, you have folks who are opposing the upzoning, uh, who are saying, well, this is upzoning is not the way we can increase affordability. And they list off, uh, you know, a half dozen other ways that, but both sides, all sides, you know, the plan commission, the mayor's office, everyone in this town is saying, we need more affordable housing. Um, we don't necessarily have a housing crisis or, or, or our data, there's been controversy among our data about whether there's a housing crisis for all uh, income levels. But one thing that everyone in this town can agree on uh, is that there is an affordability crisis. We lack sufficient housing for, uh, for low income residents. Uh, we lack entry level housing. Um, and it, it, it's, <laughs> I have a hard time understanding why a developer would come in, make promises to the community about affordable housing, uh, and then put in student housing. As far as I can see, there is no student housing crisis anywhere in this town. We're doing just fine, thank you, on student housing. And, you know, not to be misinterpreted here, we love students. And I, <laughs> I like students, but we don't need additional student housing. We don't need two thirds of a development to be student housing. This entire community, you know, you can come, I hope that, that everyone who is here comes out to the meeting on Wednesday night. There'll be an affordability amendment there and people will be speaking for or against the, the upzoning plan, but I guarantee you that 100% of the people at that meeting will be saying, we need affordability. We need affordable housing in this community. So we have a developer here that has made promises to the folks who are going to be the neighbors here. Uh, that developer has broken its promises, his promises, their promises. Uh, I don't see why they should be let off on that. Uh, you know, like you can you can say all you like about well, the density just didn't make sense for us to pursue that. Well, that's one way of looking at it. You know, the technical aspects. You know, I think what happens here is the community is very frustrated because the arguments that come before the plan commission are all kept at that technical level. Did the developer meet the technical specifications they needed? And if they didn't meet them, well, it's okay. You know, it's, it's okay if they don't have affordable housing because it just didn't fit their plans. But there's a whole different level here. There is a level of integrity. There's a level of honesty. And when, <laughs> you know, if, if you as a member of the plan commission say to me, you know, I'm going to um, meet you for lunch tomorrow at noon. And then you don't show up and you act as if it was no big deal. There were just some technical reasons you couldn't make it. What does that say about your integrity? When corporations make a promise and they break their promises, it's just a technical issue. So I, I'd like the plan commission to take this really seriously. I'd like the developer to take this really seriously. A promise was made. That promise has been broken. This entire community is very serious about affordable housing. Every single side in the debate wants affordable housing. We have an affordable housing crisis. Is that something that we're gonna do anything about or do we just give it lip service? Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, additional yeah. public comment. Yeah, we have another new hand raised, Dwayne Shaw. Yep, that's me. Go ahead. I just like to um, really thank so many of the neighborhood uh, participants today uh, in articulating some of the concerns. And I, I just wanted to just point out that there's a lot of pressure being put on upzoning in, in, in neighborhoods to add houses in places that really appear to many of us to be inappropriate. Uh, 
Yet when there's a big dollar development opportunity, what happens is nobody talks about affordable housing there, just more student housing to make lots of money. But, oh, neighborhoods, why don't you just go ahead and add, you know, rental houses on your existing properties and upzone it? And we're going to, you know, it's almost like we're being forced to have to do that when the developers in something in an area like this really can just skip out on it. Uh, it's, the whole thing is just really imbalanced. So, so I just want to thank you for the opportunity to speak. I want to thank, uh, I'm thankful for my neighborhood uh, colleagues and that's it. Thank you. Uh, is there any additional public comment? Not seeing any hands raised at the moment. Jackie, do you see any other no, public comment? No, we don't have any. Mm -hmm. All right, last call for public comment. Going once, going twice. Uh, Brad, right. I just want to point out that there are some things in the chat. I don't know. I think some of these may have been answered already, but I just want to make sure you were aware of that. Um. Yeah, we uh, saw was one, that. I saw one message asking for comment, and we recognize that that person. Um, we're back to uh, the commission now for uh, additional questions or uh, or a motion. Um, I believe I saw Commissioner St. John first there. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks. This is um, really just a question for staff. There have been a, um, like two or three people here with criticisms about the process that they didn't find out about the meeting until five hours ago. And I'm a little confused because my understanding is the plan commission calendar is posted on the city website and the packets are posted and maybe something even goes in the newspaper. So could you comment on that, please? Just yeah, as general sure. public education, I think that would be super helpful. Yeah, that that's a great uh, question. Yes. So, um, the uh, plan commission agendas run in the paper um, 10 days before. So uh, legals for this petition indicating that it would be at this meeting at this time with this Zoom link uh, were in the paper at the end of April. Um, and then yes, the packet was posted on Friday and sent to uh, those that have asked to receive packets uh, uh, monthly, including um, the council member for this area uh, received it on that day as well. Um, yes, Mr. Akers had asked when the meeting was going and I neglected to remember to, to directly email him. But yes, those um, items uh, are posted uh, the week before. And again, notice to the paper uh, about a week and a half before. Okay, thank you. Uh, Karna, also, I will also point out that they had a neighborhood meeting uh, about three weeks ago, uh, three or four weeks ago. Uh, and there were several members of the neighborhood association there. Maybe. 15 or so, um, and I believe that we said that it would be on the, uh, the May 10th agenda. Okay, thank you. Um, additional questions, uh, Commissioner Kinsey. I would like the developers and also perhaps staff to address um, the comments from the public that came in that were raised about the need for student housing. And I wonder if we could address both kind of how the developers have reconciled that through the charrette processes that they've undertaken with community members. And then if the staff could also explain um, a little bit more about the philosophy and strategy for uh, this use on this particular parcel. Um, I, I may have some follow-up questions about this matter, but I'd like to hear from the developers first about how they're reconciling some of the public input and comments today. Sorry, I think maybe they've all somehow, they've all muted themselves. Ryan, I'm gonna start with you. Oh. Yeah, I think Mark <laughs> Mark is best to, um, are you trying to unmute Mark? It looked like you are trying there to unmute. Go. Yeah, try it, Mark. Okay, can you all hear me now? Yep. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I, I, I appreciate everybody's comments um, from the public on this. And I think that those are all, um, uh, we, we really appreciate hearing the feedback. Um, <clears throat> I think this project, uh, we did start with the shred about three years ago. Um, and I think 
as with any good design, um, the charrette has evolved over the course of that week when we had the charrette. Um, and I think we've looked at many different things throughout that week, that course that week. And then um, from the three years that that has since passed since then, um, I think that the world does look a little bit different now than what it does uh, three years ago with that. Um, I know that some of the things that we were including uh, in that charrette when we had looked at it three years ago are probably not as appropriate um, right now. So I think that there's, um, there's different things and, and with any good, um, you know, charrette and then also any good design, it has to, um, it has to change based on what, um, you know, is, is currently, um, part of the zoning, part of, um, the UDO, uh, and then also just the different, um, you know, what's feasible in the project in itself. Um, I think we've looked at retail in uh, great detail. We've looked at uh, hotels in great detail. Hotels are, are really tough right now. I think everybody's probably aware of that. And I think everybody's uh, well aware of the struggles that, that retail is having right now as well. Um, we had looked at um, building retail, but to be honest with the conclusion that we came to is that it was probably most appropriate for second phase. Um, or in, in, and then also including and continuing to include Blooming Foods as one of the big retail components for the project. Um, there doesn't seem any sense to build additional retail in this area that would further compete with College Mall or some of the other local retailers that are in the area. So one thing that we also didn't want to do was build retail just to build retails and then have it sit vacant um, for an extended period of time, and then also compete with all the local businesses that are there. So, um, so at a high level, that's, that's part of the reason why, um, the plan has changed, uh, on that side, on the retail side, obviously I think the hospitality probably speaks a little bit to itself as far as, um, as far as the changes that have occurred, um, for that. And then I think too, like, as the um, UDO went through and we understood more about the UDO. I think there's a lot of really great things that came out of the process and the public input that was um, that was reached and, and worked through with the UDO in order to gain consent to gain consensus about what that should include and then how this um, how this parcel should be how this parcel should be zoned as well. So we've done our best to try to include everything that is part of the UDO um, because I think there's been a lot of a lot of debate about that in Bloomington over the past year or so. Um, so definitely think that has a high level of public input um, as part of that. And we we really thank you for the process that you've gone through for that in order to help us um, really guide us through what should be part of this and how the project should be um, designed and, and implemented. So um, I wonder if that answers your question. Um, and if there's any other follow-up questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I don't know if there are any other, or any other of the of your group that want to comment on that, but I, I do think the public's um, at least given the level of participation in the charrettes and the input that was generated around this project, it's it's understandable that there would be some concern about what's the discrepancy uh, between what was discussed and what was presented today. So I don't know if anybody else has any other comments about that further explanation. Well, Jillian, I mean, I, I can certainly say that, you know, three years ago, they were they were looking at a completely different process. Um, they were looking at coming forward with a planned unit development. Um, they had a much wider range of things that they were trying to accomplish on this site. Um, you know, and, and obviously, as I mentioned, you know, a lot's changed in the past three years, certainly in the market, uh, as well as other things. Um, so, you know, they while we they understand they certainly showed something different three years ago, you know, a lot's happened in three years. Um, and they've changed their mind. They've reanalyzed their, um, what they're looking to do on the site, what's possible, what makes sense. Um, you know, and certainly one of the things that we see a lot uh, in Bloomington, unfortunately, is a lot of commercial space that is sitting empty. Um, you know, you look over on 3rd and Patterson at Patterson Point, um, we've got commercial spaces that are just sitting empty there. Um, so the, the commercial space in Bloomington is, is over, overwhelmed right now, really. Um, you know, certainly, as you know, that there are a lot of permitted uses within every zoning district. 
um, and people have the right to pick any of those permitted land uses within that zoning district. You don't have the ability to say, no, this use isn't appropriate here or isn't appropriate there. Um, student housing is one of the permitted uses in this district, as well as several other districts. Um, so we, we don't unfortunately have discretion on, on that particular aspect. Um, and this petition is coming in, you know, by, by right. They are meeting all of the standards of the UDO. They are not requesting any variances. Um, so this is a, a matter of checking off the boxes in the UDO to make sure that they're compliant with all of our review criteria, which they are. Um, so, you know, as, as we mentioned, unfortunately, there's not a lot of discretion that we have um, with this petition. I wonder if there's also an explanation that might help all of us understand the, in addition, Eric, to the obvious one, which is that this is a permitted use on this, this property or this parcel um, about student housing. And I, I don't know if Eric or, or Jackie, if you wanna make any additional comments about the student housing demand and, and what that, how that works in the whole UDO plan and even in relation to affordable housing. Well, um, you know, so student housing, as, as you guys have heard these numbers, you know, we're, we're at 95, 96, 97 percent occupancy um, on all of these these projects. Um, you know, this is certainly a great example of, you know, market demand. Um, if people weren't renting it, if they weren't filling up, people wouldn't be building them. Um, you know, this is not to say that these units are restricted to students by any means. Um, you know, anybody can live there. And certainly as time goes on, if the market changes, um, I use enrollment changes. Uh, then there might be, uh, you know, uh, some remodeling, some modifications that happen to this site, so they lower the bedroom count. Um, you know, this is, I, I mean, honestly, this is an opportune location um, for density. Um, you are immediately adjacent to good resources, um, grocery stores, Bloomington Transit. Um, you know, this is this is an ideal location for this. Um, so you know, we think that this use certainly is uh, allowed uh, and this is an appropriate location for this type of housing. Uh, it's on a major arterial road. The hospital's just up the site. IU is two miles away. Um, you know, th this, is, this is a great location for it. I'll add, uh, Commissioner Kinsey, that uh, in the amendments that we sent to council from this body uh, last month, um, we did change some of the thresholds uh, that are being used in this petition. Um, so that future petitions would not be able to build uh, um, um, student housing of this size uh, without uh, potentially helping us address our affordable housing issue. Um, some of those items have been changed um, for future. That doesn't affect this project. I will reiterate what Mr. Grulick said. That this is a site plan. Uh, one of the commenters was commenting on PUD requirements. This is not a PUD. It's not discretionary. Uh, if we can establish that they're meeting all the requirements, then it has to be approved. Um, so that's why those items Mr. Grulick listed in the staff report that we're still uh, kind of going around on, getting some interpretations from legal about, um, those are the kinds of things that we'll be wrapping up. But um, as he said, the use is allowed. Uh, this is on a uh, major thoroughfare. It's not embedded in a neighborhood. It's an empty parking lot uh, with a large uh, empty um, black box building that's been that way for years um, and um, whether or not we need student housing or just housing I think probably a lot of the people on this call especially those who have been involved in the other wider discussions of housing recently have very strong opinions about that um, but as Mr. Grulick pointed out uh, we do have uh, very low vacancy rates and uh, whether you look at the census data for that or the local data um, they're low and uh, as Mr. Grulick also pointed out, um, if they didn't think they could fill these units, they wouldn't be building them. Um, and that at some point we do have to consider that as well. And again, it's not discretionary. We don't get to say, oh, we think this is a good idea or not uh, um, on petitions where they meet all of the requirements of the UDO. So it is our job and your job on this type of petition to make sure we think they are actually meeting all of the requirements. And then if they are um, guiding them through the process uh, to um, be approved and built. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Enright Randall. Really brief and just wanted to make a quick comment. Um, 
you guys haven't heard me speak in a while because I, yeah, I, I have faith in you. Um, uh, and ultimately, uh, I just want to uh, continue to make this point. Uh, rentals versus options to buy. You know, more permanent housing options like options to buy directly impacts affordability questions like adding options to buy. I think that's great. I've asked staff before, this isn't really addressed um, as far as a ratio of options to buy to rentals. Is this the right balance for our community? I mean, it's, it's a real thing. And then I just like to, you know, sometimes point out things I think are just really arbitrary. Three years ago, it was like this. Uh, now we see it like this. Three years in the future, are we still at the same position? So I mean, like, I understand they use their experts to evaluate this. When they proposed this three years ago, they used their experts. They use their experts again today to propose it. What are the experts gonna say three years from now? And I think this is a fair comment because I did go through this charrettes and the public was you know, having a different idea as this thing precipitated. So I do think it's, it's a fair comment to make and I hope our developers decide to take the opportunity to give the community more options to buy. Um, that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any additional questions from commissioners about a motion? Um, the staff recommendation is that we uh, continue this to a second hearing at our, uh, at our June meeting. Uh, Commissioner Seabor, go ahead. I guess before I make a motion or somebody makes a motion, just maybe a couple quick comments. I know in the staff presentation, they listed some questions. And, and I think to get back to some of those questions, like. Basically my answer to all of them is yes, we should be asking and hopefully doing a little bit better. Like ends of buildings that don't have windows, parking garage aesthetics, um, relocating dumpsters and transformers and, and all of those things. I think just generally my, my just answer is yes. I, I'd like those things to be looked into more. And, and some of the comments that you know we asked as a group through the questioning process, I hope the development team takes back and, and really thinks through those very carefully. Um, you know, really thinking about sustainability, like was mentioned in the public comment section, like in all the discussion, I didn't hear recycling being mentioned. It's, it's like just something like, like think about some of the stuff, think again, more about affordability. Um, what's been discussed in the past, um, knowing the city has a strong interest, you know, um, you know, when you mentioned that you've thought a lot about more retail or, or other types of things that could be done, when you're going through all the things you've thought a lot about, affordability wasn't listed in that discussion. Um, so really think about it and if there, if you can use some of those incentives, uh, incentives that are in place. And getting into details too about site plan, like it's so close to Blooming Foods, but if you look at some of those buildings and where the Blooming Foods store is, the people that live in those apartments are going to cut through a parking lot to get to the front door of Blooming Foods. Like that just isn't, very friendly as a pedestrian. So just looking at the details as well as the bigger picture. And, and so yes, big picture, there's a lot of good things about this project. Um, it's obviously better than what exists there today, um, but that doesn't always necessarily mean what is proposed is necessarily good at the same time. So yes, it's better, but is it good? I don't know, we need, we need a little bit more information. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Sandberg. Thank you. I certainly appreciate Tron's comment about the kind of housing that this community actually needs. Um, and I understand that this particular project is by right and there's not a whole lot we can do to, um, to alter it at this point, other than I would really prefer to see the percentages flip, the, 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 the larger portion of this project maybe be more of the multifamily and a smaller proportion be the student aspect of it. But again, they've gotten their fiscal plan in order and they have uh, come up with a plan that's uh, three years past the original um, proposal that many of us saw. And uh, we do face some really big challenges in this community. I also appreciated the comment about how 
the core neighborhoods are kind of being asked to absorb some of this uh, community need. And we are perhaps missing the opportunity to leverage what we can as a community and as a public to leverage the public benefit, which at this point I am convinced is affordable housing and housing that is more available for people looking for houses permanent places for them to buy that is within affordable ranges. So we have a host of challenges to face. We're not going to solve them all here in this meeting with this particular project. Uh, again, there is there is much good in it uh, with respect to um, changing a site that right now is a, is a gray field, as we all know. Um, there's not much happening there right now. Uh, and we certainly need to see um, uh, housing develop all over the city. Uh, again, I just wish the percentages were changed slightly to be a little bit more tipping the scale toward what this community does actually need. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I believe Commissioner Burrell was, was next. Um, I, I just want to address this with, um, with the petitioners. I think they have a, a very good opportunity here to, um, to look into some more sustainable um, options. Uh, the green roof, maybe explore this uh, before we have a, a, a final plan. Green roofs, solar panels, uh, water, capturing uh, stations, anything that you can do that can help this project be more sustainable um, and use less energy or create its own energy, if you will. Um, there's opportunities to do that. And I think it just, of course, it's big and if there's all, all kinds of things going on, but you still have time to be able to look into those things. Uh, some might be costly and some might not be as costly. Um, uh, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is just if you can explore those options before the next meeting. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner St. John. Yes, thanks. Um, Commissioner Wessler, may I make a motion? Are we, I think you were asking. Yep. So yes, I would please. like, thank you. I would like to move that we forward the petition to the June 14th hearing, um, keeping in mind for the petitioner, the five bullet points that are outlined in the staff's conclusion, as well as feedback you've gotten here this evening around environmental concerns, which I agree there's gotta be a little bit more you can do. Um, and uh, in addressing, um, you know, I, I don't know, I, I think, Mr. Grulich um, explained the situation that we're in relative to the project in three years ago in the Charettes and, and that you're complying with all of the rules here and this is by right. So I appreciate that, but that's a long way to motion. So I do move that we uh, forward it. Sorry, I had a comment in the middle of my motion. <laughs> I'll second. Um, and I also would like to make a comment after, but. Okay, yes, so we have a motion to second. The motion is to forward this to a second hearing at the um, June 14th, 2021 hearing. Uh, Commissioner Kinsey, I believe you second that. And if you'd like to go ahead and uh, make a comment, go ahead. Yeah, I'll just uh, reinforce all the comments that others have, have just uh, issued here as well. I would like to see um, a lot more in terms of green building practices. I think it's unconscionable for a building of this scope and space, despite the fact that the, the attention has been given to green space and impervious service, I think that's all right. But for a space this large uh, I, I, and this recent given sustainability concerns, I, I just, I, I don't even know how we can um, move this forward without greater attention to green building practices um, solar arrays, vegetative roofs, there's got to be more into this. Um, I, I share the concerns about a lack of diversity of housing and um, would like to probably see it a greater space afforded to the multifamily housing. Um, I understand, though, the 
concern or interest in, in student housing. Um, I do appreciate though, the fact that this is uh, potentially moving students closer to campus where they can access public transportation or walk or ride their scooters safely and get to campus safely. And that could move them out of some of the more remote locations. Um, and then those really nice locations that are south of this development uh, that are currently occupied by a lot of students could be made into more multifamily housing. Um, so I think, you know, again, when I think about all of the addition of student housing, I understand that it frees up students will move into this because it's closer to campus and other people can move into families can move into space that's south um, that they, the students will move out of um, to avoid having to drive to campus. So I think there is some balance here that um, I'd like to better understand and see uh, enacted and discuss. All of the um, uh, issues that the staff address regarding end caps of the buildings that has to be addressed, you know, that we definitely need um, better looking buildings um, or better looking ends, uh, what's visible from a public street, the garage, same, um, same issue. I think that's a real concern. And I really appreciated uh, Commissioner Seabor's comment about the access to blooming fruits from the, uh, the apartment spaces. You know, to me, there's no deliberate way to walk to blooming fruits from the, um, from the dwellings. So thinking a little bit more about that is I think important. Otherwise it could be just, you know, a bunch of people walking across a parking lot, which to me isn't any better than what we have now. Um, so that I also appreciate the decoupling of rent um, from parking spaces. I think that's an important move um, and I'm happy to see that. Uh, so all of that to say, um, you know, I, I will be looking for some of these improvements uh, at the June meeting. So thank you. Thank you. Any additional final comments? Uh, all right, I have just a just a few. Um, first of all, thank you to the uh, to the petitioner. Um, this is, I think, a um, as has been said, there's a lot to like here. Um, obviously, we're um, dramatically transforming uh, this space from something that is completely covered with uh, blacktop to something that has a lot of green space. And I think that's a plus uh, for the community. I think it's a good space uh, for uh, housing. It's very transit oriented. It's very walkable to nearby amenities. I think, um, you know, frankly, putting anything other than uh, residential in this space would be a missed opportunity. So I'm, I'm glad to see that. Uh, I do think there's, you know, some legitimate uh, question about the, you know, the type uh, of housing and the breakdown. Um, but I'm a little bit concerned about the, the direction that these discussions keep going. Uh, and this is one of the reasons that I was uh, opposed to having a, uh, an explicit student housing uh, district and, and, and use defined in our code, because it just makes it easier uh, and easier to just say, oh, that's student housing. Um, and, and by and large, this is defined as student housing because of the, the bedroom mix. Um, and, and the idea that uh, no, no one other than a student would want to rent a three bedroom apartment is just, uh, it was just a fallacy. And it keeps coming up over and over in these discussions and uh, it's, it's disturbing. Um, there are many, many, many families in Bloomington who need three bedrooms and who can't afford to buy and who need to rent. So we need to stop um, jumping to the conclusion that just because there's three bedrooms, it's, it's you know, it's just going to be a, a student party house. That's a, that, that's just not, uh, that's just not supported by the facts. Um, and furthermore, um, you know, we, we can't and shouldn't expect uh, developers and property managers to discriminate in any way. This is, this will be rentable by, uh, by Bloomingtonians of, uh, of all shapes and sizes and backgrounds and, and different uh, occupations and stations in life, families, students, retired, uh, and, and so on. Um, and that's what we should expect. We should expect that everything that's built in our city is open and welcoming um, to all types uh, of residents. And, and I expect nothing, nothing less here. Um, 
frankly, you, with, with, you know, when you compare this to uh, other rental housing options, this looks like a place that a family uh, would want to live. I mean, <laughs> they're right on a park. They're uh, right by the grocery store when compared to um, some of the, the, the housing that we are, are seeing being built um, uh, downtown and close to campus, this looks like a much more attractive uh, option to, uh, to non-students. And so I, I appreciate that. Um, uh, you know, a lot of the other things have been said about, um, uh, about parking. You know, my, my hope is that um, we could see even less of this parking uh, dedicated to residents, that we'll see more and more uh, residents here who can, uh, who can walk and, and, and utilize transit and maybe more of that parking garage will be open um, to, to visitors who want to use the park and maybe even uh, someday to uh, visitors who are uh, you know coming to uh, nearby retail. Um, and I just I just want to reiterate, reiterate again it's already been said but it seems like there, there's there's still some some misconception about what our purview is here uh, you know I think it's perfectly appropriate for the commission to, to state our opinions and to use, um, you know, encourage developers to do things that are uh, in the best interest. But you know, we cannot vote down uh, a site plan approval because of its lack of affordable housing or its lack of uh, solar panels or green roofs any more than we can vote it down because we don't like the color of the siding uh, or we don't like uh, the particular choice of playground equipment. Um, if, if these are things that we expect in every development, we need to amend the UDO and, and put them uh, as, as standards in, the, in, 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 our, in our development ordinances. It's, it's simply not fair for us to put out a document that says, here's what we expect, and then have developers come and meet a whole new um, set of expectations that are not in the code. Um, so if we have those expectations, let's, let's get serious about it and have a, a discussion about making those things uh, requirements uh, in the UDO. Um, so um, I'll reiterate too, uh, you know, I think what's been said about um, what can be improved, there certainly is room for improvement here, um, particularly in my opinion with, uh, with regards to uh, some of the architecture, the end caps, uh, certainly. Um, I appreciate that there's a bit of um, undulation with the, the, you know, the roof, uh, but it's still pretty boxy. Um, I appreciate that there's a difference in the architecture between the two buildings, but I think it could go a little bit, uh, a little bit further uh, to, to make it unique. Um, but, uh, but by and large, I think uh, there's quite a bit uh, to like here. Looking forward to hearing more detail uh, at, our, at our next meeting. Um, with that, if there's no further comment, um, I believe we are ready to call the roll. Uh, thank you. So motion was initiated by St. John. Uh, was there a second? Second oh, by Commissioner Kinsey, I believe. Thank you. Uh, Burrell? Yes. Kate? Yeah. Seabor? Yes. Cochran? Uh, abstain. Herrera? Sorry. Herrera? Uh, yep, so this uh, the motion is to continue this to the June hearing. Yeah, but the, uh, I guess it's in myself, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kinsey? Yes. St. John? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. And Whistler? Yes. Uh, motion is approved 9-0, or I'm sorry, All right. nine zero one. Um, eight, eight zero, eight zero one. one. There you go. Yeah, okay, so SP fifteen dash twenty one is uh, forwarded to our next hearing uh, by a vote of eight zero one, and that is uh, our final uh, petition on the agenda this evening. Thank you all for your time, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you in June. We are adjourned.